distinguished panel. I don't have to identify everyone because you have that in your uh, literature that you got. Uh, we will begin, as uh, it says on the outline, with Steve Usden on the Rosenberg Ring, Industrial State, Conventional, and Atomic Espionage. Steve? Thanks. Uh, I wanted to thank um, uh, Alexander Siliev again um, for, uh, for the tremendous contribution he's made, and um, uh, uh, John and Harvey uh, for what they've done, especially also for uh, giving me early access to the notebooks. Um, so I, I got the notebooks uh, uh, several months ago, and I started to write a paper for the Journal of Cold War Studies uh, about them. And when I got them, I, I realized that they're really the last piece of the puzzle uh, about the Rosenbergs. We're, it's very unlikely um, that we're going to get any more um, really important information about the case. We've got the um, declassified FBI files. We've got the Venona decrypts. Um, we've got memoirs from Robert Lamphere, who um, led the um, investigation for the FBI. We've got um, Alexander Feklisov's memoirs, um, who was one of the handlers for the Rosenbergs and some of their uh, members. Um, we've got a lot of um, interviews and work uh, with Joel Barr that I did as, as part of my book. Um, recently, the uh, executive sessions of the McCarthy Committee were released. The grand jury transcripts in the Rosenberg case were released recently also as a, as a result of a lawsuit. So w what it occurred to me is that um, there are probably very few of any um, espionage cases in the 20th century where we have this much information about it from all sides and primary sources. So what I did to create my paper was I created a spreadsheet and put um, facts from all of these different sources in a, in a chronology. And then I told a story about it, and that's, that's my paper, and I hope people will read that later. But then I realized that actually that spreadsheet itself was quite interesting. So what I did was I um, converted that into a timeline, and I put it on the internet, and it's on the uh, journal, journal, it's on the Cold War International History Project's uh, website. So now I'm going to take a big um, leap of faith and hope that it works and um, show it to you. Yeah, it does work. So um, this is the, uh, the Rosenberg Archive, uh, named uh, uh, somewhat after the, the Rosenberg file. And um, the, the key thing about this is that um, every point on the, uh, on the timeline uh, refers to a primary source document. And those primary source documents are on the web. So you can click on any point on the uh, website and get a description of the document, and you can click on the bottom of it and you get the document itself. Um, and uh, that, uh, that allows you to tell the whole story um, and see it um, yourself rather than my or anybody else's descriptions about it. Uh, getting back to the Vasily of notebooks, they, they allowed us to fill in some really uh, major gaps um, in the chronology and in the, the story of the Rosenbergs. And, um, to paraphrase Don Rumsfeld, they, they told us um, that we, they, they told us things we didn't even know we didn't know. Um, the, the most important one, uh, of course, is that uh, Julius Rosenberg, uh, who was um, tried and, um, and executed for recruiting uh, David Greenglass as an atomic spy, actually had it recruited an atomic spy before um, he recruited David Greenglass. Um, he recruited uh, Russell McNutt. And um, let me see if I can uh, find the relevant document for that. So, um, and, and the, the story about McNutt is fascinating because it shows how resourceful uh, Rosenberg was and how valuable he was to the Soviets because um, at what you can see from the, um, from the documents is that, um, uh, is that the, Soviet case handler went to Rosenberg and gave him a list of targets. And one of the targets was Kellogg, and that's the company that was building uh, Oak Ridge. And then uh, Rosenberg went out and recruited McNutt and um, got him to get a job working for a subsidiary of Kellogg called Kellex. And uh, uh, McNutt even, he'd gotten a, another job and he quit it. He'd, he'd only been on the job less than a month and he quit his other job and went to work for Kellex. Uh, and, and the interesting thing is, is that uh, Neither he nor Rosenberg knew why the Russians wanted him to work there. He took the job there. And, and then, um, as the Vasiliev notebooks demonstrate, after he'd already gotten there, then the Russians, uh, the Soviets, briefed uh, Julius Rosenberg about the Manhattan Project. 
um, and told him to tell McNutt that's what it was, and, um, and they started getting information from uh, McNutt. So this is uh, another example, and another thing that's very interesting about the Vasilyev notebooks is that they uh, corroborate a lot of information from other sources and fill in details. So this is, this is an example of how the timeline works. So the, there's a, uh, you know, so, something that's a, associated with a date here, February 7, 44, McNutt gets a job at Kellex, and then uh, I've got a little note about it, and then you click on this, and the actual document, the page from the Vasilyev notebooks comes up. Um, and this shows in, in shorthand that um, a good friend of antennas, that's uh, Rosenberg's, Russ McNutt, uh, is a civil engineer. Uh, he asked Rosenberg where he should work, and Rosenberg suggested he should work at Kellogg, and he got a, a job at Kellex. Um, and, uh, and there's a little bit more detail about uh, McNutt there. Uh, some of the other things that are really um, interesting uh, from the, and really important from the Vasiliev notebooks is that they allow us to have a chronology of when the different members of the Rosenberg ring were recruited. Um, we've really never known that before. We've had some suspicions about it, but they, it puts it in, in uh, a, a pretty precise dates on things. Um, one of the interesting things, of course, is that it, uh, it confirms that uh, the, the, the information that Julius Rosenberg started to approach um, communists uh, in the United States trying to reach Soviet intelligence before the Nazi invasion of Germany. And that he worked, of course, through the war, and that they worked for the Soviets up until 1950 uh, when they were arrested. That suggests that they were willing to work for the Soviet Union when they were formally aligned with the Nazis. They were willing to work for them when they were allied with the United States, and they were willing to work for them after the Second World War when uh, the only real conceivable uh, foe of the Soviet Union was the United States. Uh, so we have here uh, one of the pages from the Vasiliev notebooks uh, that says, uh, talking about liberal, um, Julius Rosenberg, it says he was recruited to work for us with sound, that's uh, Golos, uh, in late 1941. So that's when he actually managed to make contact with Golos. There's other information I go th through it in my paper um, indicating that actually he started trying to, to make these contacts with the Soviets quite a bit earlier. Uh, one of the other um, really interesting things in the Vasiliev notebooks is it tells us about another um, agent uh, named uh, uh, Nathan Sussman, who uh, Rosenberg recruited. There we go. And uh, Sussman uh, was a close friend of uh, Rosenberg's and uh, a member of his uh, Communist Party cell. But w we'd never known uh, before, he was, his code name uh, in Venona was Nil, but we'd never known before uh, who he was. Though I have to say that I guessed it and had it in my book um, several years ago. <laughs> uh, um, so uh, uh, the interesting thing about McNutt was that uh, he, he had um, access to information about um, Oak Ridge. And uh, I think that we're going to hear a little bit more later about the importance of Oak Ridge. But uh, basically, it's where the uh, technologies for, um, uh, for uh, making highly enriched uranium and for developing plutonium were developed and, and was a very important uh, facility uh, for, for developing a, uh, the atom bomb. Um, but despite whatever importance McNutt had, and, and um, arguably it, was, it pales in comparison to, to many of the other atomic spies, the, the really important thing about the Rosenbergs, and this is also highlighted in the Vasiliev notebooks, is um, the role that they played in non-atomic um, espionage. And you have to imagine the time that they were working. This was um, in the early days and then throughout um, the Second World War when the, um, Russia um, had very little capacity, no capacity really, for doing uh, research and development in um, uh, high technology and electronics. Um, they were, they were um, struggling to survive. And uh, at the same time, they, they were seeing these advances that were happening in the United States and Great Britain and in Germany. And they, uh, they knew that they needed to keep pace with these things. Uh, the, the Rosenbergs gave them, the Rosenberg Ring gave a tremendous variety of information, of technical information. Uh, David Greenglass um, told the FBI that, um, uh, this is a quote, that um, the Russians had, a, that Julius had explained to him that the Russians had a very small and very poor electronics industry. And then parenthetically, Greenglass said, this of course 
is another name for the radar industry, and that it was of the utmost importance that information of electronics nature be obtained and gotten to him, things like electronic va valves, vacuum tubes, capacitors, transformers, and various other electronic and radio components were some of the things that he was interested in. Um, but in fact, from the uh, Vasily of notebooks and from the FBI files and from Venona, we can find uh, the range of technological information that the Rosenberg gave, Rosenberg Ring gave to the Soviets was much more. They gave them uh, manufacturing specifications for virtually every radar system used um, and created during the Second World War in the United States, including some that were never deployed uh, during the war, but were deployed in the Korean War. Um, and uh, they gave them the, the proximity fuse, um, which after the atom bomb arguably was the second most important weapon of the uh, developed uh, in, the, in the war. They gave them um, analog computer technology that was used for syncing um, uh, radar systems to um, anti-aircraft weapons. Uh, artillery. Um, they gave them um, uh, jet air, they gave them the uh, design for the first American developed uh, jet engine. Uh, they gave them uh, a lot of early information about um, uh, jet, jet aviation technology in general. And anyway, I've got another paper I'm writing about all the technologies that they gave it. It will come out in a few weeks, but a few, a few months. But basically, um, leaving aside the atomic espionage, the Rosenberg Ring gave um, the Soviet Union, kind of the access to the core technologies um, for the early Cold War. <coughs> Radar, anti-aircraft weapons, um, uh, even sono buoys that were used to detect submarines, uh, an amazing am uh, amount of material. Uh, and the rate limiting factor really seemed to be during the war the amount of film that the Russians, 35 millimeter film the Russians could get. Okay, I'm going to rush through because I only got five more minutes. Uh, I was going to show this all on the timeline, but. I we don't have time. So um, some other things that are uh, important, uh, there's uh, been a lot of contention about what Ethel Rosenberg's role in the um, Rosenberg ring was. What the Vasily of notebooks demonstrate and correlated with all the other material is that um, she was aware of uh, what Julius was doing. Not only, as the Venona document showed, did she know that um, Sussman and Barr were um, Soviet agents, but she met with two Soviet handlers. Um, they're, not, they're not identified. But that shows an extraordinary amount of trust that, um, that the Russians uh, actually introduced her to two handlers. And there are, doc there are, there are notes in the, um, in the file that um, indicate that the Russians had contemplated using her independently um, as a courier uh, and, in, and in other capacities. Uh, but those things didn't happen because they were going to happen in the mid 1950s, late 19, uh, mid 1950, late 1950, and of course, um, David Greenglass was arrested, and, and the whole thing uh, fell apart before that. Uh, another uh, kind of theme that the um, that the Vasily of notebooks uh, underline, uh, despite what uh, I kind of have a little bit of disagreement with what um, some other people have said about this, is the 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 real wholesale failure of American counterintelligence, and one of the uh, kind of benchmarks for that is the fact that um, three members of the Rosenberg ring, including Julius Rosenberg, were fired from uh, positions as uh, civilian employees of uh, the Army uh, because they were communists. And each one of them, within six weeks, got jobs for private industry that gave them access to higher levels of classified information. <laughs> and, um, and they all continued working. and and. Most of the most important information that they gave to the Soviet Union was obtained after they'd already been fired for jobs from jobs because of their communist connections. Um, I guess I think my time's up. I could go on all day. But thank you. I'm sure we'll have more uh, comment more and yeah, some other points in the discussion. Uh, Greg Herkin, a target enormous Soviet espionage on the West Coast. Well, my talk is actually going to be somewhat general uh, in nature uh, here. And, uh, and as I say in my paper, um, 
for the conference that, are, that uh, essentially uh, I see the, the notebooks as adding to the corpus of material we already have from other sources uh, that in, in, I think in my case, really there was no, no particular revelation that concerned the Oppenheimer. It didn't change my, my conclusion about things, but I think it just added uh, uh, additional evidence uh, for the case. This is, uh, and this of course is one of the Venona decrypts. This is in, in reference to Uncle, who was actually the bag man for the party in Alameda County, but it was also a talent spotter who shows up in the, uh, not only in Venona, but also in the notebooks. Mine's, mine's different. <laughs> Uh, and we also, have, of course, have uh, Soviet documents, um, not as many as we'd like, but here is one uh, from March 1943 that basically is uh, Igor Kurchatov uh, giving to the KGB the intelligence targets uh, that he has most interest in, in, in and you'll notice that uh, the radiation laboratory at Berkeley is first on the list. This is because of the work being done there uh, by, among others, Oppenheimer, uh, Lawrence, uh, Seaborg, especially the work on plutonium. Uh, and here's a picture of the Rad Lab, more or less at, at that time, and um, uh, several scientists who were of interest that we now know to Soviet uh, intelligence, including uh, Louis Alvarez, uh, Ernest Lawrence, which, I, in fact, they gave Lawrence uh, a... Um, honorary membership in the Soviet Academy of Sciences in 1942, and that gave him a little red book that he said if he ever got to Moscow, he could use this to get on the subway uh, for free. Uh, and you can see that, that red book in the, uh, in the Lawrence Library uh, today. I, don't th I think Lawrence was such a Boy Scout, he didn't realize that this was sort of an, an initial step toward recruitment. <laughs> but uh, the man... Ah. The man who was uh, head and shoulders uh, above, above the rest is uh, here, uh, Robert Oppenheimer. He, of course, would be the real target. Uh, as well, the, uh, the notebooks and the documents in them add, I think, color, depth, and texture to the story we already know. Now we simply know it better and we know it in more detail. Uh, we know more about individuals like the man who introduced himself as Mr. Brown, who was actually the uh, uh, KGB resident at the San Francisco Consulate. That's Gregory Kaifetz. Uh, shown, I don't have a laser pointer, shown here. Uh, Kaifetz had the appropriate name of Karan because his job was in fact to recruit or to, to take the damn cells uh, over to the other side, if you will. <laughs> and here is, um, and here, uh, this is a picture that ruined the career, by the way, of the man in the middle. This is Martin Kamen, who was a radiochemist at the radiation laboratory. This picture was taken by an Army counterintelligence agent and um, it was, the occasion was uh, Kaifetz, who was about to leave to go back to Moscow, in fact, he had been recalled at this point, is introducing uh, Kamen to his successor, Gregory Kasparov, who will be the new resident at, um, uh, at the consulate. Uh, and as I say, this is a picture that pretty much put the end to Martin Kamen's uh, career because it was assumed that he, in fact, was being cooperative. They were on their way to Bernstein's Fish Grotto. Um, one could tell lots of stories here, but both the uh, Army counterintelligence and the FBI knew of this meeting so that there was a, a, a gaggle of agents outside Bernstein's Fish Grotto, uh, all with little earpieces going to their, their ear, uh, some of them from the FBI, some of them from the CIC, and we were discussing at lunch, there was almost a fist fight among them as to who would get to sit nearest to uh, to uh, this group, these, this trio, and overhear their conversation. This is uh, a somewhat almost uh, contemporaneous picture of the so what was then uh, the Soviet consulate, what was at the time I took the picture, uh, the Synanon Foundation, which is an anti-drug <laughs> organization. <laughs> Lo, how the mighty are fallen. <laughs> this was a few years back. I'm not quite sure what, uh, what the building uh, does now. Uh, but also it gives, and this is I think what the invaluable thing for me was to see the Soviet side of, of things. We, we, we knew about uh, uh, Pavel Fitin in, uh, in Venona, um, but we did not know as much about him as we know now thanks to the notebooks. And he comes across as actually quite an interesting and astute individual. Uh, as well, we know because the uh, notebook simply more about some of the stories we already, you know, some of the spies we already had identified, uh, in particular Klaus Fuchs. This is Fuchs's uh, ID badge at Los Alamos. 
And we know, uh, this is not from the notebooks, but this is, um, we, we knew that uh, Fuchs, uh, we knew this really from Benona and other sources, we knew that Fuchs lied when he told British investigators that he had only spied on the atomic bomb, that in fact he also passed information on the super or the hydrogen bomb, including uh, his notes on Fermi's lecture at Los Alamos University uh, in 1946 on one concept for the super. This is uh, the English version. And this is the Russian version that showed up in the archives with annotations. And we know as well that his espionage against the super continued, uh, that this is a drawing. Uh, my physicist, I'm not a physicist, nor do I pretend to be, but my physicist friends tell me that this is probably the Fuchs von Neumann uh, patent uh, that Fuchs and uh, von Neumann offered at the 19, June 1940, April 1946 conference on the super at Los Alamos. And it's one design for the super. Uh, it is not, I, by the way, I, I passed this by Herb York uh, a couple of times in detail to make sure that this did not compromise any important information. He assured me it was a kind of step toward the super, but uh, a step actually in the wrong direction. Uh, <laughs> so uh, it, so I, I hope not to be branded a proliferator. Uh, well, we know, uh, we know in, uh, also from the notebooks that uh, we know more about individuals who we knew something about, and now we know more, and we know, uh, in fact, that uh, Joe Weinberg was engaged in more than one act of providing information to the Soviets on classified project. We knew about that for reasons I'll tell you, I'll show you in a second, but that we know as well that he, and this was new to me, that he had the, uh, uh, the cryptonym method, and his wife, um, wife had the cryptonym uh, idea, and now I'm uh, Merle. Uh, but I think probably, and this is something that hasn't been mentioned, but I think that uh, it's important and arguably as important, maybe even more important than other things, and that we now know that uh, individuals there were suspicions about, and indeed whose careers were ruined at the time, really uh, were innocent. Uh, and I think that that's pretty much the case with, uh, proven by Martin Kamen, there is a passage in there when Kaisvitz says that he had, uh, that Cayman, it confirms Cayman's version of events, by the way, that Cayman had given him some information on the radiophosphorus treatment of leukemia, and because uh, that was Cayman's area, was radioisotopes, uh, but that there was no information passed regarding the atomic bomb project. <coughs> and obviously a figure of great importance uh, to us and to the Russians back then was J. Robert Oppenheimer, who uh, appears in the, the transcripts uh, as under three cryptonyms, Chester, Chemist, and you. Uh, Oppenheimer was an obvious uh, subject of interest. This is his picture uh, as director, Los Alamos. Um, and the Russians had reason to believe that he would be a willing source, um, that he was, as they said, a secret countryman, um, fellow countryman, he, uh, member of the secret party. Uh, his wife, Kitty, uh, had been a member of the party and had been married to a party organizer. Uh, before that, Jean, uh, his girlfriend, Jean Tatlock, whom he almost uh, married on a couple of occasions, uh, had been a member of the party, and in fact it was Jean who at Berkeley both humanized and radicalized Oppie. His brother Frank was a member of the rank and file party and appears under the cryptonym uh, Ray or Beam. Uh, Jackie Oppenheimer, Frank's wife, uh, had been a member of the party as well and uh, was worked uh, on a paper in Pasadena, The Western Worker, which was the West Coast version of the Communist Daily, while Frank was in graduate school at Caltech. And we know as well that uh, friends, social friends of the uh, of the family of Kitty and Robert both was uh, a social friend was Steve Nelson, who was essentially the head of the Communist Party in Alameda County. We know as well, and we knew this before. This is an FBI wiretap that uh, there was espionage against the Manhattan <coughs> Project. This was. Uh, I won't get into details, but the FBI wiretapped the uh, people they knew to, knew or suspected to be communists. Uh, the Army wiretapped the people who were working uh, for the bomb project under the Army. And uh, this was uh, late at night on uh, March 29th. An individual who identified himself only as Joe came to Steve Nelson's home, said he worked on the project up on the hill, the secret project to separate uranium, and gave Steve details about the uranium separation process. The Army actually picked this up, notified the FBI. Both sides began looking for Joe and by other identifiers in the transcript, the, Ar the uh, FBI wiretap transcript, they determined that Joe was uh, Joe Weinberg, uh, seen here on the left. Uh, this is Joe Weinberg, Rossi Lohman, it's David Bowman, Max Friedman. It's taken in front of Sather Gate. These were all uh, Oppie's uh, grad students. 
Uh, we know, and actually uh, this, this confirms what I had argued in, uh, in my book, Brotherhood of the Bomb, that Louise Branston was a, so, um, a contact, uh, a talent spotter. There were, in fact, 11 talent spotters. There were 11 people who were, are mentioned as being people who should or could or would uh, approach Oppie. And, uh, and, the only, and they're all listed here. I put one name in parentheses because it's the one name that does not appear in the transcripts, and that's Faucon Chevalier. We can get to that later. But we know George Eltington was the one who made the actual approach to, um, to Oppie, uh, actually through this individual, Faucon Chevalier. Uh, we know this was a climactic event in, in of course, the hearing. It was at this, this is, in the course of the 893-page transcript of the 1954 loyalty hearing, that it is where Oppie admits that he has lied about the Chevalier incident. He gave one version to Pash, Army investigator, in 1943. He gave another version, a uh, very different version, in uh, 1946 to the, uh, um, uh, to the FBI. And one of those versions can't be true. He had to have lied. He admitted that he did. So very quickly, uh, the Oppenheimer mysteries, uh, was he a communist? And I guess I'll have to go through this quickly, but um, uh, basically in this, this first question, um, uh, um, I should say that Chevalier said that uh, Oppenheimer and he had belonged to a closed or secret unit of the professional section of the Communist Party in Alameda County from 1938 to 1942. Oppie uh, denied that. The Oppie, uh, rather, Chevalier in 1964 writes to Oppie, this, these are in Oppenheimer's papers, Library of Congress, and says, basically, I'm going to write this memoir, and I'm going to talk about things that, you know, the fact that you and I, uh, you're, you, you're on my membership in the same unit of the CP from 1938 to 42. He mentions a publication called Reports to Our Colleagues, which he says Oppie had a role in writing. Um, and in fact, actually paid for the, pin the printing and distribution as well. Oppie writes back and says, Dear Hokan, um, you asked if I object. Indeed, I do. I was never, uh, I have never been a member of the Communist Party, and thus have never been a member of a Communist Party unit. Oppie uh, talks to Lloyd Garrison, his attorney. Uh, Lloyd Garrison, as a good lawyer, says, Well, is there any evidence for this, what Chevalier says? And Oppenheimer says, uh, well, I talked to Joe, not much. On the, on the other hand, manifesto, I think I remember what about, told Joe, uh, maybe awful mess. Well, the reports to our colleagues actually showed up in the Bancroft Library. Uh, they, they actually had been sent to, uh, the pamphlet had been sent to UCLA, had been intercepted by the police chief there and sent to Robert Sproul, the president of the university. Uh, Hokan Trevalier said that Oppie not only wrote, paid for the printing and distribution, a fact that, by the way, was confirmed to me by Phil Morrison, but that he also helped write the event, uh, the, um, uh, the document. And how can one tell authorship uh, when it's not, it's only signed College Faculties Committee Communist Party of California? But there is, and actually Kai Bird pointed this out to me, there is a, a phrase here that uh, one sees, it's a little unusual, and more and more surely, uh, and that's an expression that actually Oppie used in his letters to Frank. Uh, this is in the Chevalier papers, which are in the possession of his daughter in, in, uh, in France. And this is a researcher who wrote to the daughter, Corinne, asking for evidence, as, I'm sorry, wrote to Hokan, asking for information about the secret so-called unit. And uh, Chevalier writes back and says, well, I'll, I won't talk about the ones who are still alive, but I will talk about the ones who are dead. He mentions a number of names, including Professor Arthur Broder. Broder was the um, uh, head of Scandinavian languages at, uh, at Berkeley. So I, I basically, uh, I didn't know what to make of this. Was Oppie lying? Was Chevalier lying? Who was telling the truth? So I punted. Basically, I have a, a, a Rochemont-like uh, paragraph <laughs> in, uh, in my book. Oppenheimer would later characterize the group as an innocent and rather naive political coffee, cl coffee clatch. To Chevalier, however, it was something much more, a closed unit of the Communist Party, in effect a secret communist cell whose members, part of the CP's so-called professional section, were discouraged from holding open membership in the party. Well, this is where it, it, it lay, basically, until the book came out in fall of 2002. And about two months, I think, after the book came out, John Haynes contacted me and said, <coughs> we've just been given a manuscript that you may find of interest. It's the, uh, the uh, memoir, uh, unpublished memoir, of Gordon Griffiths, uh, who was a professor of history at, at the University of Washington, who had been a graduate student in the late 30s and early 40s at Berkeley, history graduate student. And it turns out, as, as Griffith confirms, he was liaison between the rank and file of the party and uh, the closed unit, uh, the professional section of the party, the faculty unit at the campus. And uh, he wrote this. He died in 2001, as I recall. He wrote this. Oh, well, okay. He, uh, 
I think this proves uh, one thing, <laughs> which, which is simply that uh, Oppenheimer was that Chevalier was telling the truth, and Oppenheimer did lie. That sh that uh, Oppenheimer was a member of this closed unit of the party. I secondly, the other thing is, and I won't have time to get into this, but and maybe in discussion, uh, Oppenheimer was not a spy, um, and this is the reason that uh, that I've come to this conclusion is that that Caron, as Fitton says in many places in the memoir, yeah, I'm sorry, in the notebooks, uh, has had no results and was unable to uh, recruit Oppenheimer. Final presentation is by Robert Norris on the previously unknown spy until added by Mr. Putin, President Putin, a few years ago, George Koval. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'm a bit of the odd man out here since uh, George Koval is not in uh, the Vasilyev notebooks nor in uh, John Harvey <coughs> and uh, Alexander's book. But nevertheless, um, I, I, I am planning an article in um, the Journal of Cold War Studies and it'll be in the fall issue rather than the summer one. Um, as Ron said, on October 22nd, 2007, Russian President Vladimir Putin posthumously bestowed the hero of the Russian Federation gold medal on George Koval, quote, for the courage and heroism displayed in carrying out a special mission, close quote. Uh, ten days later, uh, Putin handed the documents over to the defense minister to be placed in the GRU museum. Uh, with smiles and toasts all around, photographs and film of Putin and his generals were published in newspapers, shown on television, and we learned, not for the first time if we had been more careful, but that um, uh, of a new and interesting, important spy. To publicly reveal an agent's role in espionage, atomic or otherwise, is highly unusual, especially when the disclosure is made by the President of Russia, a former KGB officer himself. Koval, an American citizen, spied for the Soviet Union for almost 10 years, from 1939 to 48, with his most important contribution being the 11 months he spent at Oak Ridge and the six months he spent at Dayton, Ohio, working on key Manhattan Project facilities. Putin praised his work, <coughs> saying that he provided information that helped speed up considerably the time it took for the Soviet Union to develop an atomic bomb of its own. <coughs> Since my time is short here, let me quickly introduce you to uh, George Koval. He was born in all, of all places in Sioux City, Iowa. His parents had emigrated from uh, what is now uh, a tiny village in uh, Belarus uh, around 1910 and 1911. <coughs> they settled in Iowa, and uh, George was the middle son um, born on Christmas Day, 1913. Uh, he went to grammar school, junior high school, high school in Sioux City. And he went on to the University of Iowa. And <laughs> at that point, in about 19 in 1932, uh, his father and, and, and mother, apparently, uh, decided to move back to the Soviet Union to um, be a part of uh, what Stalin had set up, which was a uh, Jewish homeland in Siberia. Um, this was all news to me and uh, rather remarkable. <coughs> um, it was called the Jewish Autonom Autonomous Region and uh, uh, the city of uh, Birodbizan. This was 5,000 miles uh, east of Moscow in Siberia. Uh, it had been founded by Stalin as a, a Jewish socialist homeland. Um, and from the late 20s on into the mid 30s, over 1,000 foreign Jews. Uh, moved there, and many thousands of Russian Soviet Jews. Uh, and of the foreigners, uh, a few were Americans, and of those were the Koval family, uh, father and mother and the three sons. <coughs> the experiment was doomed from the start. Uh, the winters were cold, the summers were hot, the soil was poor, and the emigres who moved there were naive to a fault. Nevertheless, uh, off they went, um, leaving Iowa, going across the Pacific, getting to Vladivostok, and ending up in Birodbizan. George, at that point, didn't know any Russian and um, had some difficulty learning it. Was there for about two years, and we think in 1934, went to Moscow to attend the uh, Mendeleev Institute of Chemical Technology uh, and graduated uh, with honors. Um, at some point, 
probably in the aftermath of the Stalin's purges when the intelligence services had been gutted, um, George was recruited by the GRU and uh, was sent back to the United States. After all, he was uh, a U.S. citizen. He spoke perfect American English, knew its customs, loved baseball, and as we shall see, incredibly lucky. He returned to the United States in October 1940, arriving in San Francisco aboard a small tanker <coughs> without passport, but escorted through customs by the captain and his family. Koval made his way to New York, uh, lived in the Bronx, and worked at an electric company that was uh, uh, run by um, a, a GRU uh, handler. Um, at a certain point, he was drafted and um, on February 4th, 1943, he was inducted into the U.S. Army. And here, just a lucky set of circumstances uh, will uh, land him in the middle of the Manhattan Project. <clears throat> the next step after being drafted, of course, he could have been sent to the front and, and, and been an infantry soldier. But uh, his lucky journey uh, started with uh, a program called the Army Specialized Training Program, ASTP, which was um, a way to um, take draftees who passed a test and um, not send them to the front, but put them into uh, uh, needed areas. So dozens of colleges and universities offered basic uh, coursework for these Army inductees in engineering and languages and uh, medical and dentistry and so on. So uh, George went to CCNY in New York along with uh, a class and uh, was about 10 years older than everybody else, which was a little suspicious uh, uh, in, in the aftermath. But nevertheless, uh, uh, everyone got along and um, the next propitious move that uh, occurred to uh, Koval after his ASTP training uh, was to be chosen to be a member of the Special Engineer Detachment, the SEDs, of the Manhattan Project. Uh, again, these were Army um, soldiers, generally young graduate students trained in the sciences, and rather than being sent to the front, were selected to serve under senior scientists at Los Alamos, Oak Ridge, the Met Lab in Chicago, or elsewhere. Um, Koval was among 15 uh, ASTP students from CCNY that were sent to Oak Ridge. And he was assigned to the health physics department uh, at Oak Ridge, um, basically to monitor the, the radiation levels at the different facilities. So in effect, he had full, full range of everything at Oak Ridge. He could go anywhere. And um, he put this to good advantage. Of course, at Oak Ridge, um, it was, well, the center of the, the Manhattan Project uh, administratively and uh, the place where uh, uranium was being enriched uh, via uh, th three methods. Um, and George was, <coughs> I, I believe, even given a jeep to uh, go around the vast uh, uh, facility uh, and, uh, and do his job, all the while taking in uh, interesting and important information. Um, after 11 months at Oak Ridge, uh, he was sent to uh, Dayton, Tennessee. Now, even among historians of the Manhattan Project, uh, what went on at Dayton is uh, sort of little known. But that is where uh, the polonium work uh, transpired. Uh, polonium is a uh, short-lived um, isotope, uh, polonium-210, that was used as the initiator inside the pluto plutonium ball uh, to cause the um, chain reaction to, to, to happen in, in, a, in a dramatic fashion. So again, George was the uh, health officer at Dayton and uh, had access to uh, what was going on in a relatively small uh, set of facilities and uh, apparently learned uh, a great deal about that. Um, the polonium was 
fabricated at Oak Ridge. Uh, it was then sent for refinement and, and, and concentration to Dayton, and then, of course, was shipped to Los Alamos to go into the plutonium bombs. Um, after, <clears throat> after six months at um, Dayton, um, his Army career was uh, over. Uh, in February 1946, he was discharged, uh, awarded a Good Conduct Medal, a World War II Victory Medal, and an American Theater Service Ribbon by the U.S. Army. He went back to school in New York City, and um, apparently on the GI Bill, and uh, graduated in uh, electrical, electrical engineering from CCNY. He went back to the Soviet Union in um, uh, 1948, and the rest of his career there is uh, uh, not distinguished. <coughs> the big question is um, what sorts of information might have Koval passed on to, um, to Moscow? And there we can only uh, speculate, but having the run of Oak Ridge and, and even the basic facts about the size of the place, there's 75,000 people here, they're enriching uranium in three different ways. Uh, there's work uh, going on also in uh, plutonium about how to uh, separate it. And then the, uh, uh, all, all of the just basic information of polonium, about polonium at Dayton would have been uh, terribly interesting to um, Moscow. Um, so th there's more to be found out about what he might have sent back. I, I, I treat some of this in the article. Um, in the early 1950s, and we don't know why, uh, he finally came to the attention of the FBI. Of course, by this time he's long gone, he, uh, five years earlier. Um, and a file is opened on um, Koval, which is about 900 pages long. It doesn't treat these questions that I just raised here about why they initiated an uh, investigation to begin with. Uh, nor does it say uh, what sorts of information he might have passed on. Um, and, and then just in closing, uh, we have the question of why uh, President Putin uh, might have um, made such a uh, public ceremony uh, about all of this. And I suppose it's for a combination of reasons um, having to do with praising the GRU and, uh, as to what a good uh, intelligence agency it is, um, putting a stick in the eye of the United States, I suppose, um, and giving some credit to the GRU, who in the history of the atomic bomb story have been uh, neglected uh, in ways that the KGB had not, and uh, they had their share of the story uh, beginning in the 90s, and uh, the GRU is, is catching up. and. Um, we hope to learn more. Thank you. Uh, I think I will start my comments uh, first before Bart because uh, we started with the Rosenberg case and that's primarily what I'm just going to add a few points to and it will be, I think, way under the time limit. Uh, I think the Vasily of Notebooks and the Claire Haynes Vasily of Book uh, provides, as Steve said, the final confirmation of much of what we knew about the Soviet network established by Julius Rosenberg. Uh, despite the material that began coming out with the first Venona release in 1995, a release which even led the Rosenberg's children, Robert and Michael Mirapol, uh, to acknowledge that their father was clearly a Soviet spy, they and the other defenders of the Rosenbergs have developed what I call a new fallback position. Uh, they argue that Ethel Rosenberg was innocent and framed up. Uh, they point, for example, to the grand jury material that was released a few months ago that indicated Ruth Green Greenglass's testimony that Ethel type material was clearly not true, and it was not true. Uh, and that they, although they say Julius Rosenberg served in a Soviet network, he produced nothing harmful to the United States and only passed on rather insignificant industrial espionage. Uh, they also assert he was not an Adam spy and that therefore, despite the fact that he was some kind of Soviet agent, both of the, their parents were framed so the U United States could provide a scapegoat 
in the time of Cold War for the actual failure of the United States to get people like Klaus Fuchs and T Ted Hall, whom they were never able to prosecute in America. Therefore, their final end conclusion is that the trial and execution of the Rosenbergs made them victims of the political wet witch hunt against those in the United States who dared to call for peace with the Soviet Union. Uh, well, clearly, the Claire Haynes Vasiliev book puts an end to all those kind of arguments. Uh, and here I can skip because Steve mentioned a lot of the new facts. Uh, Ethel's greater involvement than, that than was known beforehand. I want to add one point on David Greenglass. Uh, for years, people have said, it's clearly true, how could a technician who did not do well in college in the Brooklyn Polytechnic Institute and a produced rather primitive sketch, clearly inconsequential compared to Fuchs and Hall, uh, who were both physicists. Uh, the Vasily of notebooks point out that Kaznikov, the KB chief, KGB chief, noted that the information provided by all three men mutually overlap. A New York KGB station report reveals that Greenglass gave them a floor pan, plan and sketches of all the buildings, material and preparation of uranium bomb, calculations on a structure solution for obtaining U-235, which the KGB called, quote, highly valuable, as well as a description of the bomb. As Claire and Haynes and Vasily have right, quote, it was an impressive list of materials from an army sergeant with only a limited technical education. Moreover, they cite a uh, report found in the notebooks from Anatoly Yaskov that, and they reveal in the book for the first time that while in furlough, in September of 1945, David Greenglass gave Julius the actual model of a detonator for the fuse of the bomb's explosive substance that he built in his workshop. In other words, he gave them an actual model, not just a primitive sketch of the mechanism. That was not introduced at the trial. So contrary to the assertions of their still defenders, the Rosenberg network was an atomic spy network. Uh, and to say he was not an atomic spy, as they continually do, is simply an attempt to minimize the network's importance. Uh, in other words, David Greenglass, despite his limited education, did give the Soviets valuable, important material. The second point of interest that nobody has mentioned is that once Greenglass decided to cooperate to save his wife from indictment and become a cooperative witness, it was the KGB that developed the entire American left-wing defense strategy that would be employed to the letter by the Rosenberg Defense Committees. The KGB instructed, quote, it would be preferable to publish articles about the trial first and foremost in the non-communist press, unquote, and to emphasize the trial as an exercise, quote, in coarse anti-Soviet propaganda, and to shift the blame for the Korean War uh, away from the communists and put the blame onto Jews and communists. In other words, the Rosenbergs were Jews, they were scapegoats because the gov US government was anti-Semitic. And finally, they said the defense should emphasize the US was becoming a fascist country, which of course is the position that was taken. Uh, they also suggested emphasizing the horror of the planned ex ex execution of a mother of two, quote, because of some villainous brother's slanderous denunciation and to stress the immorality of the death sentence. Uh, and finally, they should constantly say there are no atomic secrets anyway. Uh, and as Claren Haynes and Vasily have mentioned, this advice came from a nation that regularly executed enemies of the people without any trial whatsoever, as well as throwing dissenters into the gulag. Now, I should also point out that this was done to the letter. The arguments in defense of the Rosenbergs came first not in the communist press, which never said a word, but in the National Guardian, which, as we now know, again, because of the Venona and the facility of documents, was edited by a man named Cedric Belfridge, who was himself a KGB agent. Uh, so it was very easy for them to get the National Guardian to start the protest movement. Uh, finally, and one other point, two other minor points, and then I'll stop. Uh, William Pearl was a major physicist who, as Steve Osden points out in his paper, gave the Soviets the major data on radio, radio aerodynamics, solar, and jet fighters. His uh, data was used to jumpstart Soviet jet fighter development. 
uh, that surprised the American Air Force in Korea when they fi faced highly effective Soviet MiGs built on the American design provided by Pearl. Uh, uh, one point in particular struck me from the facility of documents that Steve mentions in the paper that he didn't mention here. In 1948, Pearl came back from Cleveland and worked as the assistant to a man named Theodore von Kármán, who was a major, major scientist working for the Scientific Advisory Board to the U.S. Air Force and had every top secret in his safe and the material he was working on. He was working on missile issues, aviation, jet aircraft, and all cutting-edge technology of the day. Uh, in the Rosenberg file, which we wrote some almost, what, 30 years ago, uh, we speculated that since he was assistant, had a key to his safe, and he acknowledged having taken material out, that this material obviously was then copied uh, and provided uh, to the Soviets. We based this on part of the testimony of the secret FBI informant, who many people said you can't take the word of an FBI informant, the jailhouse informant who Rosenberg befriended and bragged to him in the tombs waiting, prison awaiting during the trial, uh, bragged to him that in one session, Pearl gave him material from the safe when he was working for Yvonne Carmen, and that they engaged in a marathon session of photocopying the material, which was then copied and given to the Soviets and then returned by Pearl to von Karman's safe. Now, in the book, all the hostile reviewers of the Rosenberg file on the political left specifically attacked us, one, for listening to the views of an FBI informant, and per particularly for slandering the late William Pearl because they said Pearl was a scientist who had legal access to the safe. He did nothing wrong. This was slander to say he made photograph copies of the Soviets because an FBI informant said so. Well, we now know from the facility of notebooks that, in fact, he did take the material out and they did photograph it in a marathon 17-hour session. Uh, so the files really spell out a lot of what we did not know. And uh, as Steve said, I think unless and until when we get the complete GRU KGB files, as much of the full story is known as ever possibly will be. All right, now we turn, I guess, to Oppenheimer and the other cases and to Barton Bernstein. Thank you, Ron. <coughs> if you pull out your diplomas, which I'm sure all of you carry with you at all times for ID, you'll notice in the back in a, an amalgam of Latin and Greek it asserts roughly the following. This is a very loose translation. Moses was permitted a decalogue, but you folks having uh, lower degrees are only permitted eight points. Uh, so whatever speaking at conferences, please limit yourself to eight points. Uh, when you're offered, however, 10 to 15 minutes, take the maximum of 15 minutes. Uh, it may seem nearly Olympian, but academics are known for their in Olympian imperialistic impulses. Uh, don't disappoint your audience or confers. And thus, uh, having pulled out my diploma this morning, reading it carefully in the amalgam of Latin and Greek, uh, I'm going to make eight points and take my 15 minutes. Uh, <laughs> I'd like you to begin, this is prefatory, you know, <laughs> the eight points. <laughs> notice, notice how in prolegomena uh, academics learn how to cheat. Uh, I'd like you just to reflect for a moment, if this conference were occurring in 1970, what the issues of controversy would be and how far we've moved. While this morning we had disputes about particular cases, we had also a rather large consensus on a number of points. One is there was substantial espionage. The KGB was active. It was at various levels integrated with parts of the Communist Party the issue is where, what, how, the details. The details are very important, but we're not arguing those issues that divided parts of the American left in the 1950s, 60s, and into the 70s, and that may be more significant in the cultural history of where we are than in the disputes which we will continue to have and which we should have. Well, I want from that, however, to move uh, to a number of points. One is uh, this morning, uh, having encountered Alexander at breakfast by accident and thus fortuitous, uh, I took the liberty of suggesting that he should really, in writing after the conference and in coordination uh, <coughs> with Harvey and uh, John Haynes, 
Uh, I, at least a partial response to the issues that were raised yesterday in the morning uh, about finances, background, et cetera. Uh, I realize to ask such questions as was done yesterday could sound prosecutorial and even invidious and demeaning, but it does seem to me that this is a peculiar situation and we have a rich framework of Western thought that suggests that interest often relates to behavior and that folks have a right to know some part uh, of the interest that's operating or not, including the contours of the Yale contract, which I'm sure provide the munificence of $1,000 or 500 or 2000 But I do think this is important for all of us to remove part of the cloud. Uh, all the cloud cannot be removed because it seems to me this is unusual but not unique, and that one person has had access to materials that others cannot see. It's not his fault. But thus we're dependent upon his notes, selectively taken, and we hope carefully done, but most of us know in copying, we make mistakes. Even if he's exempt and twice as good as the rest of us, there are probably a number of errors and what does this mean? Anyway, this, I mean, we should, it seems to me in using the notebooks, we should operate on two levels. Uh, one is to retain some questions about exactly how gathered, and the other is to use them selectively, but with the awareness of the selectivity. <laughs> Beyond that, uh, let me say that the kinds of issues raised by the notebooks, assuming as I am that they're reasonably or even more than reasonably reliable, raises some questions that we haven't talked about, and I'd like you to reflect upon them. That is, given that there was substantial KGB espionage in the United States, what kind of loyalty security program should Truman have created in 1947? Was he remiss in not doing it earlier? Was he remiss in doing it so soon? Should the standards have been what they were, or should they have been more stringent or less stringent? Uh, if you were doing it now based upon what you now know about the rough contours and depth of KGB espionage, what kind of loyalty security program would you impose back in roughly 47 or 45 or perhaps 49? And what would this mean for rewriting the cultural and political history of the 1940s and early 50s? From that, with a very loose and lame, if not awkward, segue to the issue of the FBI, it does seem to me but Steve has shown the case of the Rosenberg Ring that the S FBI, even if wonderfully vigilant, was markedly careless. Uh, they, they didn't get the right guys. And there was a good deal of evidence. Beyond that, one of the people who has, I think, not been mentioned at all, although appearing in lurking form in the papers, is uh, what about J. Edgar Hoover? That is, we've looked at the FBI as an agency, and agencies are agencies, but they're not, they have hierarchy, they have functions, they have divisions and distinctions, and what about the person at the top, and how does this relate to what was going on in counter-espionage? Beyond that, since we are talking substantially about the A-bomb, the project Enormous, et cetera, uh, let me ask a question, and let me ask you to think about this. Let's say there had been no espionage on the A-bomb project, and thus, according to David Holloway and others who've looked at the Soviet project, and I guess David has looked as deeply at this as anyone uh, from the West can, his estimate is that the Soviets would have developed the bomb probably a year, year and a half later if they'd been operating autonomously and without, without espionage. If they developed it a year to a year and a half later, what would the difference have been in American and in Soviet foreign policy, would there have been monumental differences? Obviously, this is a counterfactual, but counterfactuals responsible and limited are an interesting way to rethink a history. In turn, what about if at the end of World War II, or shortly before Hiroshima, the US had given the Soviets the plans of the major plants for extraction of uranium, plutonium, and even devising building the A-bomb. 
And thus, let's assume in that kind of counterfactual that the Soviets would have developed the bomb by mid-late 47. What would have been different? That is, one of the questions I want you to think about is, would the course of U.S.-Soviet relations have been worse, better, about the same? Would the crises have been in the same areas, different areas? Of course, counterfactuals are loose ways of thinking, but they're not irresponsible ways of thinking. And thus, to put it a little differently, uh, when Walter Lippmann in 1946 and Patrick Blackett, the Nobel laureate in 48-49, suggested the bomb was not really the decisive weapon, were they giving us leverage on thinking about espionage, even though, of course, neither Blackett nor Lippmann in any way knew about espionage? But let me move from that to an issue I raised very briefly this morning, and I don't want to dilate at great length, but I do want to come back to it because it does seem to me that a conference like this is often in danger of getting involved deeply in the particular issues of particular people. Was Stone, was in Stone, was his, was in his, and those are very important issues. But I want to come back to the lurking matter of evidence because I think it's important. Uh, in doing espionage and related history, should we have different standards? Uh, one answer given by the chair this morning was no, and historians should never have different standards. But historians do have different standards. Let me give you an example. If you're writing a book about X, and you're in, X walked into the room and saw the green carpet. Do you really lavish as much attention on deciding whether the carpet was green, or maybe that said gray and you misread it, as what X was doing of monumental importance? Of course not. That is inherently in the enterprise of history, we always have implicit standards about what's more important, what's less important, what we dwell upon, what we do casually. Gray carpet, green carpet, doesn't really make a hell of a lot of difference normally, unless it's a body that's going to be wrapped up. <laughs> okay? Given that we, in fact, and I can prove this, and all of you know this from your practice as historians, that we have different standards, it comes back to, if you're dealing with somebody dead, and thus it's a posthumous judgment uh, on them, uh, should you be more concerned about the standard of calling them a spy after the fact, even if the issue is narrowly perjury, it really was about spying, than it is if you're talking about something else in their life? Uh, I think that we should have higher standards. I'm not committed to this, but I think it's something we should think about, worry about, and talk about over time. Secondly, to go back uh, to the point that I raised very briefly, and again, we'll only do briefly today. If you think about how we make judgments as historians, we actually implicitly use probabilities. We're just not explicit, because that's what physicists do and not what historians do who are inclined to a narrative form, and probabilities get in the way. They clutter, they sound semi-rigorous, etc. Should we, however, on the important issues we deal with, try to figure out what our probabilities are, and even in a footnote, if not in the text, indicate? I mean, for example, if you say something is very likely, to your listener, that could mean 18% or 94%. The problem with adverbs and some adjectives is they offer pseudo-precision with remarkable ambiguity. On things that one really cares about, maybe the struggle to be more specific has a great value. And thirdly, and related to that, uh, I want to come back to the issue of when somebody says case is closed, case is open, he was, he wasn't, what's the threshold of evidence? Uh, are you using 50% plus? Are you using 96% plus? Are you operating in the uneasy penumbra where historians loosely operate? Something like that, maybe. Unspecified and let your reader guess, and then the reviewers will argue about it. I think these are issues involving espionage, somewhat unlike lots of other issues that historians deal with, where specificity and the struggle for specificity really has a value in clarity, improving dialogue, and focusing upon evidence and its meanings. And I would urge all of us to be more self-conscious about this and more explicit on the crucial matters. I want from that to talk about Oppenheimer. Uh, I'm delighted that there's consensus 
on the panel and with Marty Sherwin and Priscilla McMillan in the audience, and I'm sure some others. There is no evidence that he was a spy. When you read the notebooks, I mean, what's fascinating uh, is how often the KGB folks, you know, damn it, approach him. And they have a whole group. I mean, one would have to believe the notebooks have really been markedly rewritten uh, are incredibly disingenuous for all those efforts by all those KGB guys to try to reach Oppenheimer. I mean, they can't even figure out where he is. In one year, in late 43, early 44, they're looking for him in Berkeley. Of course, he's been in Los Alamos since March, April 43. They're not very good at this. Uh, in fact, I would suggest the K I'm going for 15 minutes. Uh, I'm going to suggest that the KGB and the FBI were truly warranted adversaries for one another in multiple ways. Uh, on the issue of was Oppenheimer a member of the Communist Party, Greg has come to the conclusion, I think it's fair to say definitely. Uh, I've come to the conclusion, which is not what I'm happy with because it undermines what much of what I wrote many years ago. Uh, among, you know, you don't like to revise yourself. You don't like to have been wrong in the past. And one should never admit it. Uh, that the evidence is very high, far more probable than not, I would put it. But Marty Sherwin, who's equally smart, shared the Pulitzer Prize, has worked on this for 25 years, has come to the conclusion, no. And as I understand Marty's kind of argument, would be the following. If you look at the notebooks, there are only three documents that, that indicate he, Api, was a countryman, you f member of the party. There's no way of knowing whether when we look at three documents, we have truly three separate documents, or whether we have, as the FBI did, a core where every time the KGB writes about somebody, they pull out the core and they add stuff to it, but they really are not doing anything independent. So we may have one document transposed three times. That's far less evidence. If you look at the other evidence uh, on membership in the CP, you can pick it apart strand by strand. And that speaks to the issue of how you conduct analysis, argument. Uh, do you look at every strand, or do you weave the strands together and then criticize the weave? If you look at every strand separately, you can make a better negative case. If you weave, it's a harder case to make is what a more warranted way to argue than the other. Historians have really never addressed this in any principled, uh, lengthy fashion. Uh, I think that Marty's position that Oppenheimer was not, the evidence is, is, is inadequate. Uh, he clearly was not under party discipline. It's not a position that I would share, but it is not an unreasonable position. It's an eminently reasonable position, and the dialogue among scholars has to continue being from Greg and definite to Marty and no. And we really will need far more evidence and a discussion of standards before we can come to a judgment uh, that many of the rest of you can incline toward, if not fully adopt. Uh, thus, I hope that I've added something to the dialogue uh, muddied the clarity and suggested new rules for thinking about clarity. Thank you. Exactly 15 minutes. Well, again, I apologize to all the panelists who I promised Christian I would scrupulously cut off everyone in 15 minutes, so don't blame me, but I did my job. A uh, couple of people I promised to speak to uh, continue the conversation. First, let's turn to Marty Sherwin uh, and have him comment and uh, he again shared the Pulitzer Prize with Kai Bird uh, on his biography of Bobby. Thank you. Uh, we certainly didn't get the Pulitzer Prize for uh, deciding whether Oppenheimer was or was not a communist. <laughs> so I'm Dr. No, I guess. Thank you, Bart. Um, and uh, I guess I'll just talk to that uh, issue because it's really the only one that's been raised about Oppenheimer. I had expected uh, some others to be uh, discussed also. I'm glad Greg put up the uh, Gordon Griffiths um, quotation there, uh, which reads that if payment of dues was the only test of membership, I cannot testify Oppenheimer was a member, but I can say without qualification all three men consider themselves communists. 
Um, well, Oppenheimer didn't. And when I spoke to uh, Hokan Chevalier in 1982, in about six hours of taped interviews, which are, have been given to the Library of Congress, and unfortunately, for purposes today, uh, they were given, and I couldn't get to them uh, last night. Um, I asked him over and over again, and this is all in the transcripts, explain to me what this unit was. What did you do? And he said, well, we talked about uh, the situation. Uh, what situation? Well, the situation in the world. I said, okay, and who brought you together? How did you organize this thing? Well, we came together ourselves. Who did you report to? We reported to no one. And it went on and on like that. And he was in the midst of writing a book, he said, uh, that was going to reveal uh, the true nature of Oppenheimer's relationship to the Communist Party and his relationship, et cetera, et cetera. And there seemed to be absolutely nothing there. Um, so I think Greg Herkin had it right when he wrote um, Brotherhood of the Bomb. And this evidence that comes along with Gordon Griffith's uh, uh, memoir or biography, whatever, uh, is, I don't know, evidence that has to be taken into account. But Griffith doesn't say how he knows that these three men considered themselves, you know, communists. Uh, supposedly, Oppenheimer paid dues through Griffiths. Oppenheimer uh, denied that. Oppenheimer was always giving money to various causes through the Communist Party. Uh, was it dues? Was it not? I don't know. Uh, let's give that 50% uh, credibility. Uh, the question of Communist Party discipline which one has to be committed to in order to be a communist. I would say 99% Oppenheimer is certainty that Oppenheimer never did that. I leave the 1% to show you what an open-minded guy I am. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, so my conclusion and Kai's was that uh, Oppenheimer was not in any meaningful sense a member of the Communist Party. And I'm going to pass this microphone to Priscilla McMillan, who was the author of this wonderful book, The Rune of Robert Oppenheimer, uh, and see what she has to say about it. Okay, well, honestly, <clears throat> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Can I just, yeah, Greg. oh, just briefly, that, that I, uh, Marty, who's been a friend and a colleague for more than 30 years, he was in my dissertation committee, uh, he and I actually, I think, have come a little bit closer in, in uh, position. He has moved somewhat, and I have moved somewhat. So what I say is that, in fact, uh, although perhaps not, I haven't moved enough, that, uh, that I think it is true that, that Oppie was a member of this closed unit at the professional section of the Communist Party. Does that make him a communist? As, as uh, Griffith said, he didn't pay dues directly in a, in a normal way. He actually paid them to Steve Nelson and Isaac Volkoff, who was the bag man, and he paid more than he had to, and the FBI recorded those transactions. Um, as far as the issue of party discipline, the, the letter to our colleagues, though, and, and oh, by the way, uh, I also agree with Marty's version of this closed unit or discussion section, whichever you want to call it, that they didn't get around and, and talk about betraying the United States. They mostly talked about probably pretty boring stuff, but matters of the party line. But the latter letters to the editor, uh, letters to our colleagues um, date, as I recall, from 1940. I think one is, uh, in, in fact, take what is plainly a, a party line, one of them is in fact in support of the Soviet Union after the invasion, uh, uh, after its invasion of Finland. So that uh, even though uh, on this issue of party discipline, that, that I would argue that Oppie was following the party line probably till, as he <coughs> said, December 6, 1941, uh, when he went to a Russian relief party and decided coming home, because he was now involved with the bomb project, at least tangentially, that he'd had enough of this and wasn't going to take it any further. Uh, yeah, we used to call people who considered themselves communists and didn't pay dues, dues chiselers. 
Uh, I, I just have one question about Marty and Greg. Uh, since these people aren't here, the Schechters did not show up. Are they here? Terry and Leona Schechter. Uh, they claim in their book, for those of you who read it, that Oppenheimer was a spy. And they cite this one document, but they do not give a citation to where they got it from uh, that they say is the proof that Oppenheimer was a spy. Uh, could you just briefly comment on their assertion? Yeah. Well, actually, I, I deal with that in the, uh, the essay. And, and it's a, uh, uh, a memo from uh, Merkirloff to Beria in October 1945. And it says that Oppenheimer, in effect, has been working for us as a source of information since 1942. But this gets to Bart's issue of, of evidence and of proof. And the, um, the notebooks are full of Pavel Fitton, and Fitton was in a much better position to know what his spies were really doing. He was their direct superior. Uh, he says continually, Karan has failed to organize himself, uh, it, it, many references to that effect. Uh, Kaifetz recalled from, and this is his uh, summary, conclusive, and unequivocal verdict, Kaifetz recalled from the U.S. for failing to cope with his job, and indeed we know he left in July of 40, 44, July, August 44. So I, I think that the burden of ev the burden of proof, the burden of evidence is I don't know what percentage Bart wants to pick, seems to be uh, much more on Fitton's interpretation than on Mikurov's. And Mikurov was not the only one to gild the lily, as it were, or pad the resume. That also uh, Zubalin, uh, Maxim, who was the, s the senior KGB officer in the U.S., gave initially a. Um, oh, this is this is uh, uh, Pavel Fitton's. Um, memo on that. Maxim describes Caron as serious operative with initiative without, however, citing a single fact to corroborate this evaluation. Uh, the facts indicate that for almost a year, Caron has done nothing concrete. But I think this is a case, and it was alluded to yesterday, of agents wanting to show that they have accomplished more than they, they really, or at least that their agent, superiors wanting to show their agents have accomplished more than they actually have. You certainly would not want to bring a bad fitness report to Beria. Uh, this is <laughs> this this is a case where where failure is not an option has to be the KGB motto. Uh, so I, I think that that is really what you read in uh, in Zubalin's uh, more positive account and also in Mikurov's. Although it's too bad that Jerry and Leona Schechter aren't here because I I know when I was writing my book I asked them for the provenance of that document. I asked them for permission to reproduce it. In fact, in the book and and I was denied on both counts. Mm. Uh, it would be, uh, I think it probably is genuine. I'd like to know myself where, mm. where it came from, where they got it, and, uh, uh, and the rest of it. Well, yeah, Herb? I'm sorry for my voice. I need a microphone for that. Um, I would like to say that I'm very impressed with the facility of notebooks. They're not the last word. They're the latest word. And we have to discuss the notebooks in that context. They're an extremely valuable window on the KGB and its functions, but just a window, because Vasilyev did not have many things that, as scholars, we would like to have. For example, the GRU files. He did not see them. He did not see the files on atomic energy, except for file number one. The rest of the files were given to Chikov, who was another KGB officer who was supposed to write a book, and said he just mixed up all the files change of names, made new, new code names, and all kinds of nonsense. So his book was never published in the United States. He did not see the files of the illegal resident tour of Akhmerov, which is called Junga, the German word for youth. Akhmerov sent back to Moscow 2,500 documents in Photosat. You did not see them either, because you didn't see the illegal files. You only saw the American Directorate files, or, or the, uh, th that which is now available, or was available then for, for uh, an American author. And they did something even more clever. You never actually got to, to see the files in situ. You didn't get to the KGB uh, headquarters to examine the files. That was on the Ring Road. You call it, uh, what, the, uh, forest. the forest, yeah. It was not in, you know, directly inside Moscow. It was not in Lubyanka. It was at the, in the Ring Road facility. And they would bring you, uh, Kobolazza would bring you those files that you requested if he wanted to bring them. And then you had the responsibility of giving him your notebooks. And apparently you did not. But Kobolazza was in charge of that operation. So there's much you didn't see. 
You didn't see atomic energy materials. You didn't see GRU materials. You didn't see an Eagles materials. So that when Akhmerov says to a class of KGB officers that his best spy in the United States was Harry Hopkins, you don't believe him. But Akhmerov was in charge of that work. He knows a lot more about that work than you did as a short-term officer in KGB. Ahmerov was a much longer-term officer and got medals that you would never dream of, like on the checkist, which was shown on the board before. So that's the defects in the notebooks. The positive thing about the notebooks is that they are totally consistent with Venona, and they're consistent with the FBI materials and the investigations by the Intelligence Committees and the American Activities Committee and the House of Representatives, because that information is also of value in examining what the U.S. government knew and when it knew it. The FBI files are only part of that story. But everything that you have said in your notebooks is consistent with the material there, and you did not see the owner, and you did not see the FBI files, and you did not see the congressional hearings when you wrote your notebooks. So I believe the notebooks are totally accurate and have to be treated in that way as an accurate source, but just mm -hmm. a window, not, not the whole story. All right. But Do you want to respond to that? Well, before you respond, can I tell you one more thing? You mentioned Martin Kamen, and you exonerated Martin Kamen. Uh, Heifetz, before they sent him back to Moscow, wrote a report on his successes. Heifetz was assigned to the Jewish Anti-Fascist Committee, which was a place to get killed. And of course, they did kill most of them as soon as the war was over. Well, Heifetz was the KGB officer, or NKVD officer, assigned to, to work with the Jewish Anti-Fascist Committee. So he was on his way down. And other officers writing evaluations of him were, were write negative evaluations. But one of Heifetz's agents was Louise Branson Berman. At that point, she was married to, to Richard Branson. And uh, she reported, well, let me give it to you exactly from the notebooks. This is from uh, White Notebook number one. In, my, in connection with my departure, he passed along uh, semi-official secret anthologies as a president of the USSR scientific institutions. Shortly before, he gave similar material to MAP to send to the Union to the American Russian Institute. So Kamen was providing information to both uh, Louise Branson Berman and to Heifetz. So you want to give him an exoneration? He was spying for the Soviets. No, he wasn't. Uh, what he provided were, in fact, manuals having to do with radioisotope treatment, radiophosphorus treatment of leukemia patients. The Kaifetz had told him, and apparently Kasparov as well, that there was an ailing consular official up in Portland, Soviet official in Portland, who was dying of leukemia, and they wanted to have access to this treatment that was a specialty of John Lawrence's and that Martin Kamen knew about because he worked with John Lawrence in the radiochemistry lab on that very thing. And in fact, it was papers, unclassified papers, having to do with the, treat the radioisotope treatment of cancer that he passed along, and there is a separate place in the notebooks where, in fact, Kaifetz says that. All right, uh, can we go well, on well, to we'll Alexander talk to you? Uh, mm -hmm. Herb, let, let uh, Alexander also, uh, respond to oh, some. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I would like to, to, uh, to respond to Herbert Hammerstein and uh, to Barton. Uh, I, I, s I didn't see many things I would like to see, that's true. Uh, uh, I saw some, uh, some, a number of documents on illegal stations, not the files which belong to, to the illegal department, but the documents which are in the operational correspondence files on the uh, Akhmerov station and uh, uh, Markin station. Mark Markin was the station chief before Akhmerov. Nope. Okay. Oh, uh, sure. I, I agree with you. I agree. Now to um, about what uh, Barton Berson said. Uh, this is an interesting idea. We to <coughs> to disclose all my finances. Uh, 
uh, <laughs> and put it on the internet. <laughs> we'll, di we'll discuss it uh, with uh, Harvey and John. Um, I, of course, I am not in a position to praise myself for, for being accurate and meticulous, and uh, perhaps uh, you, you may want to ask John and Harvey, since they had experience of working with me. Uh, but uh, it's important to mention that I worked in the archives with an assumption that uh, a consider considerable part of the documents will be released, because this was one of the um, points in uh, the uh, agreement between a Crown pub Publishing House and the Association of <laughs> Retired Officers. A considerable amount of uh, documents should have been released. And of course, I was copying them and uh, as, uh, as accurately as I could, and because I didn't want to look like a fool after they are released. Now, Crown unilaterally uh, broke the agreement, and uh, after that, uh, the, the Russians uh, uh, didn't have any commitment to, to release any documents. Uh, that's an important point. I also want to comment. Um, there were some. There are some suggestions coming from uh, certain circle, circles that uh, I uh, probably fake all of this thing or a part of uh, of these materials. Um, I'd like to comment on that. Uh, with all my respect to uh, John and Harvey, I don't think that even they could could do something like this, because this is a huge amount an amount amount of information, and uh, uh, there is which is m which makes it even more dangerous. There is a huge amount amount of information on the American side to which I didn't have any access at all. Uh, I. I remember perfectly well the example of General Volkogonov, who lied about uh, swallowing the dust in the KGB archives looking for materials about El Jihis, and his reputation was destroyed in, in a few days, just in a few days, and he had to admit that he lied. Now, this example would discourage anyone from uh, faking anything concerning the United oh. States. I didn't mean even to imply no, that. I'm not, no, it's but, not about uh, you. But uh, let me suggest to all of you collectively uh, the corrosive thought that you should not accept that the standard of being outed will lead to people who err, whether systematically and intentionally or otherwise, will be outed. It doesn't happen. Uh, there's a well-known journalist, Richard Reeves, who wrote a book that Time Magazine in 93, I believe, called the best nonfiction book of the year. He cites many documents that don't exist. I can say that with authority because I checked about 100 footnotes. Mm. Uh, he cites some things that whole paragraphs are added that are not in the document. In, most, in those cases, I have the documents. Uh, the result was that the Washington Post, when <laughs> receiving my letter in response to his critique, removed the last sentences. I later learned that Ben Bradley and Sally Quinn had given Richard Reeves his coming out party for the book. Uh, I followed the reviews of the book over the years. It's called something like Profile in Power, forgotten the exact portrait in power, forgotten the subtitle. But the point is that almost no reviewer ever went back and checked sources. If you actually look at the writing of American history and you go beyond the issues that are contentious to the issues that appear non-contentious, as a profession, we almost never check when reviewing other people's work. If you start checking, you'll discover very distressing information, I assure you. And, and, and that's why I created the timeline that's on there, because all the documents are there. I want, can, can, can I finish? Uh, yeah. I'm finishing. Yeah, and then uh, if I wanted to, to fake something, I would, I would uh, fake you know, more, m much more exciting stuff than we have. You Robert Oppenheimer and Absolutely, stuff. absolutely. I, will, I would have uh, Harry Hopkins as, a, as an agent. Oppenheimer as an agent, I would fake stuff on uh, Hemingway, and uh, uh, just sim you know th there was there is this constant discussion about uh, Alger his and uh, Alice. If Alice is his, 
if his is Alice. It would take me 15 minutes to fake a document saying that Alice is LG his. I never did that. I always said that I never saw a document directly saying that LG his is Alice. All right, I, I promise, Michael, uh, let me do in this order. Michael Dobbs, who, as I recall, years ago, before he died, had the interview with Yatskov on the Rosenberg case. Before Yatskov correct? died. Yeah. <laughs> yes, before, before Yatskov died. I admit, you are still with us, fortunately. Uh, and then uh, Ed Mark, who's been raising his hand for a long time, and then Stan Evans. So let's do it in that. Uh, uh, so, Michael. Well, well, just on Alexander, I don't think anybody here accused you of faking stuff. I mean, I think there is a legitimate debate about how you interpret these documents, but that's another matter. But I wanted just to talk a little bit about um, something I was personally involved in, um, how the, uh, the, the, namely the journalistic hunt for the um, uh, Soviet spies in the Manhattan Project and the light that the Vasilyev notebooks show on this. Uh, I was a Moscow reporter for the Washington Post in the early 90s when the KGB started talking about uh, its penetration of the uh, Manhattan Project. And um, I asked to see uh, Lona Cohen, who was one of the couriers to uh, Los Alamos. They said uh, she was very ill, but um, I could go and talk to a man called Anatoly Yatskov, who I'd never heard of at that time, who ran um, the main atomic spy ring at uh, Los Alamos. And he told me that in addition to the um, uh, spies that were known in the West, um, uh, Greenglass and Fuchs, uh, that he had at least half a dozen other spies, and he mentioned one of them, uh, Mlad. Now, I wrote about that for the Washington Post at the time, and at the same time, a big story had come out in a, a r Russian journal called Novia Vremia by Vladimir Chikov, somebody mentioned here, um, which um, mentioned a spy called Perseus, now, I put the two things together, and this kind of set everybody off on a world hunt for uh, Perseus, who, which turns out now, I think, pretty convincingly, it's been demonstrated both in Venona, but certainly in the Vasilyev uh, notebooks, that Perseus was a composite. There's a man called Pers, Persian, but not uh, Perseus. Um, so a lot of that, I mean, I think, Looking back on it, what Yatskov told me back in '92 was pretty accurate. He didn't tell me everything, but it was accurate. But the muddies, the waters were muddied by um, uh, Chikov, Chikov's article in Novia Vremia and launching us all, all on a false trail for uh, Perseus. Um, okay, so then the Venona documents, Venona releases come out in 1995, and um, reading through them. Uh, like some other researchers, I identified Mlad as uh, Theodore Hall and went actually to confront him in uh, Cambridge. Um, now, what I find interesting about the Vas okay, so what's interesting about the Vasilyev notebooks? How does it advance our knowledge of um, what we know about Theodore Hall and Mlad and that entire incident? Um, I think, as uh, Greg Herkin said, that it adds details, color, context to, um, to what the Venona uh, documents told us. Um, it's got a lot more information about how Ted Hall was uh, recruited, what he did, the series of meetings that he had uh, in Los Alamos with his couriers, uh, including Lona Hohen Cohen in the summer of uh, 1945. Um, it also sheds light on a mysterious episode involving a uh, Harvard professor called uh, Roy Glauber. Um, there were four young Harvard physicists who were recruited for the Manhattan Project. Ted Hall was one of them, and Roy Glauber was another. Um, and in the Venona documents, it says that uh, th th there's complaints that the whole <coughs> recruitment of Hall has been <coughs> compromised by a man called Grauber. Now, it was ob you know, pretty obvious that Grauber was Glauber, just badly transliterated. And I and others talked to Professor Glauber at the time. He said he knew nothing about this. Um, he d had known Hall. He was a friend of Hall's, and he was actually a roommate of Hall's at, um, at Los Alamos. But he didn't know what this reference to him was in the Venona documents. 
I think it's now become clear as a result of the, um, uh, uh, the, the new materials uh, supplied by uh, Vladimir that exactly what happened with Glauber, that um, uh, Glauber and Hall were friends. Um, Hall's courier, his another Harvard, uh, uh, another of their Harvard roommates called Savile Sachs, came down to Los Alamos, met with um, uh, met with Hall, and Hall suggested there's this other man called Glauber who's uh, also expressed some unease that we're not sharing uh, atomic secrets with um, with our allies, the Soviets. Um, and um, uh, apparently, according to these uh, documents, Hall at one time approached Glauber and said, if you really want to, uh, if, y if you think we should be sharing uh, these, this information with the Soviets, I can help you do it. Glauber did not report that uh, conversation to the security people in Los Alamos. And the Soviets uh, feared that this was a penetration, that that uh, that that Hall's uh, co cooperation then w with them had been um, involuntarily discovered by Glauber, and that Hall's usefulness as a source uh, was over. Mm -hmm. so this is all uh, pretty much explained in the Vasilyev notebooks. So, having you know launched myself on this journalistic investigation 17 years ago, I think pretty much uh, the, the six uh, sources that uh, uh, Yatskov claimed to have had in uh, Los Al not just Los Alamos, but the entire Manhattan Project, I think are pretty much known now as far as, as, far as I know. We don't know the, all the GRU sources, but the, uh, but the KGB sources are, uh, are pretty much known. So I feel this is a kind of culmination of a pretty much a two decade effort to, um, to uh, establish uh, the extent of Soviet pen penetration at Los Alamos. Thanks. Thank you. Ed? Uh, thank you. Um, so Professor Herkin's uh, presentation put me in mind of an interesting anomaly about the, G the FBI's declassification of documents on this period. You will recall that he showed the transcript of a taping made on the East Coast of Oakland, actually. Of Oakland, uh, of, of Soviet uh, operatives. There is no such corresponding set of documents for the West, for the East Coast, as far as I know. No transcripts of uh, Soviet conversations on the East Coast. And yet we know that the NKGB, the world's best intelligence service at that time, by a margin of advantage, was reporting that it was being thoroughly and comprehensively bugged by the FBI, that they had found microphones in offices, in automobiles, and that the FBI had even learned the cryptonyms of agents, which is precisely why in 1944 all the cryptonyms uh, were, were replaced, as one can see in Venona. So the question then becomes, where the hell are, are, are the records of these tapings? Were they destroyed? Do they still exist? And if they still exist, why haven't they been made public? Yeah, where's John Fox? Yeah. Is he here? <laughs> well, I, I, have, I have some information on that. They were actually not, uh, in, in Steve Nelson's case, uh, that conversation was, um, was a wiretap. It was his telephone. The telephone had, was made into a receiver. Oh. And, and the recordings were made actually not on tape, but on presto disc, which is, I don't know, an, an a, it was a highly flammable acetate plastic. And it only lasted a few a few times when you well, played it. Presumably, if there were if there were transcripts made on right. the, on the West Coast, they were made on the East right. Coast. Right. And I'll I'll go one point further. By the way, I heard from years ago now, and this is only a rumor. I'm not going to confirm it because I'm not in a position to do so. But I heard from a member of the intelligence community that Akmerov was bugged for a while. Well, so Louis Bran Louis Branston was bugged. I in fact interviewed the FBI agent who had. Uh, had placed the microphones, he and his partner, uh, in her house on Green Street. So, I think it's time to move the conversation on. Well, in any case, is, if John Fox has John a comment Fox on is? this, I'd like to hear it. And I hope that somebody else will pursue this under the foyer right. or something. Oh, John? Here. 
Well, for one, the, the comment about um, KGB fears of being completely bugged included mention of bugging cars, which, if I remember the technology of the day, would have been pretty hard to hide considering how big some of that stuff could be. Now, wiretaps, of course, and microphone surveillances were common and often used, and they're obviously, with the Nelson case and a, a number of others, clear evidence that, that that was. And what would happen is, as was it Greg mentioned, the acetate disks, transcripts would be made because the physical recordings couldn't be kept very long, and the transcripts appear throughout the files. Um, any one place, I have no idea that there's any big collection of them, but you find those references throughout the files of various uh, technical surveillances throughout this period, and of course, especially the early Cold War, especially once you start getting the Bentley um, revelations in 45 and the follow-up from some of those. All right, uh, Stan? Wait for the mic. Thank you. Uh, my name is Stan Evans. I'm with the Education and Research Institute. And this follows pretty naturally from the colloquy that was just occurring about wiretaps and records. And also the question of whether Robert Oppenheimer was a member of the Communist Party and whether the FBI was a bunch of bumbling incompetence and the security system that prevailed in the United States, all of the above. And also, it connects to the question of the accuracy of the Vasiliev notebooks. And what I'm going to quote, I think, shows how accurate those notebooks are, among other things. This is from the FBI's Oppenheimer file, volume one. I'm old school. I carry paper around and not, <laughs> not a laptop. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Uh, and so, this is uh, obviously either a wiretap or a microphone plan. I think it's a wiretap. A report very early on from the FBI about Oppenheimer. And I'll read as briefly as I can what it says. In December 1942, mind you, Julius Robert Oppenheimer was the subject of a discussion between Steve Nelson, already mentioned, and Bernadette Doyle. Organizational Secretary of the Communist Party for Alameda County, California. Nelson stated that Dr. Hannah Peters had been to visit him, and she had stated that Dr. Oppenheimer, because of his employment on a special project, could not be active in the party. Accordingly, Bernadette Doyle answered Nelson by saying that she believed the matter should be taken up with the state committee regarding the two oppies inasmuch as they were regularly registered and everyone knew that they were Communist Party members. So Bernadette Doyle to Steve Nelson. Two communists talking to each other in confidence, so they thought. Later on, Bernadette Doyle further informed John Murrah, a suspected KGB agent, um, informed Murrah that Mrs. Oppenheimer and, and her husband were, quote, comrades, unquote, and that, uh, that the husband was working on a special project in the radiation laboratory at uh, Berkeley. Bernadette Doyle stated that Oppenheimer was a party member, but that his name should be removed from any mailing list in John Murrah's possession, and he should not be mentioned in any way. Professor Hergen, I think this confirms your conclusion pretty strongly. Uh, and this was all before we had the, uh, the um, documents that were referred to, the, the uh, Griffiths Memoir, which is a very important document indeed, and the Chevalier material you posted on your website, uh, all saying the same thing. Uh, how there can be any doubt about this uh, is a mystery to me. Now, the reason I say this goes to the question of the FBI, the FBI was all over this in 1942. They reported this information and a lot of other information about Oppie in 19, November of 1945 to President Truman when Oppenheimer was moving from the jurisdiction of the Army uh, back into the civilian ranks. And this information I just read to you was summarized in this report of November 15, 1945. It was totally ignored. And Oppenheimer subsequently, as we all know, received his Q clearance and served for all those years until 54 when it was uh, finally lifted. In the connection to uh, Mr. Vasiliev's very fine notebooks, by the way, and this great book that uh, John and Harvey have produced, which is a 
another uh, great accomplishment by them and, and contribution to our knowledge. In the, the, the notebooks, I originally read this in the Haunted Wood, Mr. Vasiliev, and, and I'm sure you remember this, but you quote a memorandum, which was a February 1944 KGB report, uh, which you copied down, in which they talked about Oppenheimer, and uh, it said the compatriot section received from its center, meaning the Communist Party, from tech words, an instruction to cease relations with Chester, meaning Oppenheimer, to avoid compromising him. That is identical to this information. And I suggest that therefore the confirmation works both ways. Not only does your information confirm what we knew from the past, from other documents, FBI files, witnesses before congressional committees, and so forth, uh, but the material we already have confirms what you say, because you did not have this information, did you, that I'm talking to? So that's, I'll leave, put aside the question whether he was an espionage agent, which I think is an open question in my mind. But he was a Communist Party member, I don't see how anyone can question that. Uh, Jim Hirschberg? Hi, two quick comments on uh, the Oppenheimer uh, issues. One is it, it seems to me that the, the key issue is, is not uh, whether he was or wasn't a, a member of the party as technically defined. I think it's pr pretty clear that he did not carry a card, pay regular dues, fill out a form. Um, the, I think the key issue, as, as Marty Sherwin indicated, is whether he actually sacrifices intellectual independence and put himself under party discipline at such a crucial moment in history. And just as, as a, a point for further investigation, I, I think the issue of whether the reports to the colleagues um, that he may or may not have written red points to you know, intrinsic, uh, inimitable, happy language we provide some interesting evidence. I think it's crucial to those reports with what Oppenheimer was saying and writing to friends and family members about things like the Nazi-Soviet pact, the Soviet invasion of Finland. You know, does it appear there is some contradiction between what he would believe anyway and what he would advocate as a member of the study group or the like? Um, the other thing is, having quickly looked through uh, Yellow Notebook Number One, I just want to point out to. Bart and Greg and Marty and, and Priscilla and, and others interested in Oppenheimer, qua Oppenheimer, not only Oppie as party member and or agent and or whatever he was. Um, there's some very important evidence about Oppenheimer's political beliefs about the bomb and the world and Truman buried in the notebooks, which doesn't appear to be reflected in the book because it doesn't bear on those other controversial issues, uh, especially from the fall of 1945 and particularly his uh, beliefs about Jimmy Burns and Harry Truman. And so anyone who's interested in Oppenheimer's uh, evolving beliefs about international control, the use of the bomb, I, I urge them not only to read the, the interesting section of spies, but actually to read in the notebook. Thank you. Can I, can I just make, uh, I put on the, uh, the screen a, uh, a part of Gordon Griffith's diary that I was going to quote from, because he, uh, he anticipated exactly your point and, uh, and made the point that Oppenheimer uh, may have been a secret communist, but he was also an American patriot. Jim, I, th I think the issue of Oppie and the CP goes more deeply than intellectual independence. I'm not sure that anyone has actually argued that Oppie, if a member, was other than intellectually independent. I think the issues go to the following, however. One is it would mean if he was a member, he had perjured himself repeatedly, which is actionable in law and often can lead people to imprisonment. Secondly, it means then, and this I find very painful, that Teller and Straws may well have gotten it right, as well as Gordon Gray. Uh, I, in writing years ago, didn't get it wrong because I didn't assert he wasn't a member. The whole, the two studies were predicated on the obvious assumption that he wasn't a member, and thus I never <laughs> asserted what was so obvious. Basically, I wrote on quicksand and I'm sinking slowly in <laughs> before your eyes. Uh, but it does raise the question, you see, that Straws, I was told by his son and Straws' secretary, Virginia Walker, had actually suspected 
that Oppie was a member, had been a member of the party, but it couldn't be proved, and the great value of the security risk rubric was it solved the problem of removing and legitimizing removal of clearance without having to make the contention, which was near draconian and not provable, but would accomplish the same legal purpose. And that, I think, is a very important set of issues. Uh, to repeat, I don't think anyone has contended that Oppenheimer, by temperament, was other than intellectually independent. This was not a temperament subject to party discipline. And Chevalier's wife, Barbara, when I queried her on this, you know, dismissed it. And at least one other person also dismissed the likelihood, which doesn't prove, but it does suggest. I know that. I happen to have been the person who got those materials declassified. Marty again? Marty? Um, re with respect to that uh, telephone conversation, um, obviously Kai and I read that and lots of other telephone conversations. Uh, there's no doubt that the communists the members of the Communist Party that Robert Oppenheimer hung around with believed that he was a communist. Uh, he was into that. He, he saw things during the period from 36 to 40 or 41, uh, often the way they saw things, and they talked about it. Uh, and he was very smart and very articulate and he formulated their ideas beautifully. Um, but that doesn't prove anything except that they thought that he was a communist. I mean, what was it to be a member of the Communist Party? I mean, Frank was a member of the Communist Party. He joined the party. He had a code name, he uh, paid dues, he had a card. You know, all of, all of that. This secret stuff, uh, at least with respect to Oppenheimer, is a little bit bizarre. I wonder what kind of reports and conclusions we would draw if all our phones are tapped after this meeting and we discuss what happened at this meeting and what we said of each other and thought of each other's views. Uh, that's not very good evidence for anything. It's something to consider, for sure. And if you have the view that you have and that Strauss has, uh, of course you see that evidence as profoundly um, uh, making the case. But if you're a little bit skeptical about it, uh, then you come to a different conclusion. Well, let's get somebody, anybody who has not spoken yet? There's one person back there, let him go. Okay, if I could turn oh, wait, 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 wait. Let you back, back, back. Uh, my name is, is Stephen Shore. I claim no special knowledge of this period, but I just want to make an analogy that if someone hang, hung out with vegetarians, never was seen to be eating uh, meat, and was, and was quite content to have people label him as or her as a vegetarian, wouldn't it be really splitting hairs to insist that, um, that he was not a vegetarian when this was, he had no problem with all of the members of the group accepting him as such. So I mean, granted that it's a wholly separate issue of whether he used his position in a disloyal way, which I think has not been proven, but I think it's ra really rather nailed down that the man was, and it, one could arguably say it was morally worse to be a secret member rather than openly open member and, and know, know that it was a inflammatory enough to have perjured himself not admitting it. Uh, um, yeah, all right, well, all right, all right, all right, let him go and then Herb again. Yeah, go on. I'd like to return for a moment to the question of Ethel Rosenberg and ask each of the panel members this, this question in light of Professor Radosh's observation that the trial testimony against her 
uh, by Ms. Greenglass was false, confirmed as false by the grand jury minutes. Do each of you feel today that she was properly uh, found guilty and was guilty beyond a reasonable doubt of the capital offense of wartime espionage? And secondly, even if you do, do you feel it was proper for Judge Kaufman, who had discretion between life and death, to impose a sentence of death for what Ethel Rosenberg did? You want to take that first, sure. Steve? Well, of course not. That, and I don't think that I'd be amazed if anybody would argue otherwise. She, the, the point is that uh, wh what we learned from the Vasiliev documents is that she did play an active role in supporting Julius's espionage. But if you ask the question, does it rise to the level that she should have been executed, the, the answer is clearly no. And you can f you could list 100, 200 people who committed uh, espionage or supported espionage that was far more serious than what she did and suffered no consequences. The most obvious case, of course, is uh, Ruth Greenglass, who, who actually did more than Ethel did. She uh, uh, helped to recruit David Greenglass. She served as a courier. She accepted money from, um, uh, from the KGB. She had a cover name, um, and you know nothing happened to her. There, there are many others. So, um, so the issue of whether she was, she was, she should have been executed. I, I don't even think it should be on the table. But, uh, but there is the, the the other issue, which is was she complete a complete innocent and had nothing to do with it, as she's been portrayed, and um, that's also not true. Oh, was she yeah. guilty beyond a reasonable doubt? Well, well, that's quite a different. Let me let me answer it in another way. I, I think that uh, framing the issue, in the, the problem is that uh, I would argue as we did years ago in the Rosenberg file, that not only did they want to be martyrs, but when Fike Farmer, the lawyer from Tennessee, came along with a novel argument to appeal to the Supreme Court that they were possibly tried under the wrong act, and if they were tried under the correct act, there would no be, no be, not be a death penalty attached, the defense team employed by the Rosenbergs argued against Fike Farmer on behalf of the same position as the Justice Department because the Rosenbergs really wanted them, preferred to go to their death as martyrs uh, uh, because they were loyal uh, defenders of Stalin and considered themselves soldiers in his movement. And in fact, uh, while they make up the death, making the issue of the death penalty was a way to get sympathy for them uh, that they wanted. They were really not opponents of their own death penalty. If you look at it, they wanted the death penalty because that made them greater martyrs and turn the world's attention against the U.S. as the evil force, not the Soviet Union. And I, I think one of the points I make about that is that I think that what the Vasiliev notebooks also show is that there was probably another element in it, which is that <coughs> there were a number of Soviet agents who Julius Rosenberg had recruited and handled who the FBI had never identified. And he probably realized, and Ethel probably realized, that if they'd started talking, that the whole thing would have unraveled, and those people who had, in a sense, put their lives in their hands um, would be imprisoned um, and and um, uh, and suffer serious consequences. So, in their own minds, they were probably also um, going to the electric chair to protect those people who put their faith in them. Uh, it does also lead you to wonder what those individuals who went on and led very comfortable lives in many cases uh, and suffered no consequences for it, what they thought about it. But does um, our system of justice execute people because they want to be executed? Well, I think we all agree that none of them, there's been many reasons not to execute any of them. As we all know, J. Edgar Hoover himself has said Ethel should not be executed. But in fact, I think that uh, who knows what would have happened when the Soviet suppression of the Jews was made public and it all became clear the Rosenbergs were still living. They may have felt they were serving a vile cause and turned completely and then told the truth about anything. For years, they, uh, their death allowed them to be portrayed as martyrs and innocent when they weren't. Now, there were scores of reasons not to execute them aside from the moral reason. It was, and again, as you all know, it was originally done, ju done just to have a lever because they thought that would force Julius to tell the truth, but he was such a good soldier. Uh, even though was, they were both going to be killed, he didn't budge one inch. Uh, yes, Herb. Yeah. Herb? Yeah. The question has come up of the nature of the Communist Party and the party's discipline over its members, and whether you had independent thinkers in the party. 
uh, Louise Berman's next husband, oh no, I'm sorry, her previous husband was Richard Branson, who was also known as Bruce Minton. Minton was a very active member of the Communist Party, as was his wife, Ruth McKinney. In 1945, they didn't like the idea of Browder being removed and all the Browderites remaining in the leadership of the party. Everybody who remained in the leadership of the party had been a stooge of Earl Browder, as maybe Ron Radish will, will tell you. So they opposed this, and they said they need a new party leadership. The result was their expulsion from the Communist Party and uh, them going around making speeches to little groups of people in, in the party trying to convince them of their, their, uh, the, uh, you know, that they were right about uh, the leadership of the party. When uh, some of the dissident groups decided that they needed to appeal to a higher authority, they wrote an open letter to Comrade Stalin to please come in and clean up the American Communist Party as you did so many times in the past. <laughs> These people were totally dedicated Stalinists. They believed what Stalin told them. As Stalin said, today is, is Monday, today is Monday. For Oppenheimer to be in such a group without uh, revealing his independence, as you people think, is impossible because there was constant pressure on the party membership to answer uh, to questions and to, 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 to tell the latest line. The funniest thing in the party was if somebody would get up and make a new speech, everybody else would get up and say, he was exactly right. I thought that before he started to speak. This is uh, the, the mor morals of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union transported into the United States. Sounds and like the faculty senate of Stanford University. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, 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 would hope, I would hope that as bad as the academics are, and they are pretty bad, they're not as bad as you just indicated. What the Communist Party is, and Ron will tell you, they didn't tolerate any other viewpoint, but more than that, they made you say what the viewpoint was. So that if you were at a meeting and you didn't speak up, or you sat down too soon, or you clapped too late, you were suspe uh, suspected of being something of a, a, a deviationist. And uh, the charge, of course, usually was Trotskyism. Many of these people were not Trotskyites. But the, the killings in the Soviet Union of the Jews, Ron, did not start after the Rosenbergs were convicted. The killings started with the Jewish Anti-Fascist Committee where a group of people, including Kaifetz, who went to jail, and uh, Molotov's wife who went to jail. But uh, McHoles and, uh, and Pfeffer were murdered, and many others were sent to the Gulag and killed in the Gulag. This was the, the committee set up during World War II to get support of Jews for the Soviet Union's war effort, and they wiped it out after the war. Well, can we, yeah, yeah, let's move on and uh, see if there's other issues to be raised all the way in the back. Yes, oh, Katie, I didn't see you. Katie Sibley. Katie Sibley, St. Joseph's University. Yeah, I'll, I'll change the subject a little bit. Um, I wanted to ask the panelists if they'd like to comment on one of the um, assertions made by uh, Haynes, Claire, and Vasiliev that the atomic bomb being tra technology being transferred to the Soviet Union helped to expedite the Cold War and the chill and the, the, the really kind of fear in the country in the United States and reaction to that and sort of exacerbate things um, in that way. And that was one of the one of the real consequences they argue of the of the sharing of this technology. And I wondered if the I don't if I'm not interpreting that exactly right, I apologize. I was sort of just summarizing that. Um, if you'd like to comment on that, I'd love to hear. Thank you. You know, that, as Bart would say, that's one of the counterfactuals. But uh, I, one thing we know uh, from David Holloway and, and others who've looked at the, the Soviet program is that the Soviet scientists, the Soviet physicists were, of course, first class. And in fact, um, they had a design that was somewhat more advanced than the American design, as I understand it, but were basically not going to take any chances because they knew the consequences if right. they pushed the button and it didn't go off. Uh, so it, and they caught up very, once they had proved to Stalin that they could copy a bomb, uh, they actually made improvements and I think it was by 1951 they had a more advanced and more efficient design that was uh, equivalent to the American, the best of the American designs. And if there's a physicist in the house, maybe you could correct me, but that's my understanding. There, I was, uh, uh, unfortunately, I, I have, I've been ordered to take my slides off the screen, but I was going to uh, tell you that um, 
uh, Chevalier uh, decided that he was not going to risk a, uh, a, a lawsuit, so he only referred in his uh, memoir uh, of Oppenheimer's story of a friendship uh, to a discussion group, is how he, he described it. But uh, he wrote a novel called The Man Who Would Be God, and that was this that I had up on a minute, uh, a minute ago. And in it, he, uh, it's about Oppenheimer. The, the figure of Oppenheimer is called Sebastian. And, uh, and he covers uh, actually that whole issue about uh, whether Sebastian considered himself a communist, whether he, the other members of the group considered himself a communist. very articulate, which wouldn't surprise me. But I, sorry, um, maybe Steve, if you could comment on that issue, because you I did some wonderful research, I think, about this whole issue of the of the you know the technology transfer and all of that. And do you think that do you agree with that assertion that I sort of got from the book that it did create a greater chill here? Because espionage, in fact, sort of exacerbated our kind of McCarthyism, if you like. I'm just wondering if if am I making do well, I make sense I, in that comment? I, I think that that there's a big distinction between the technical espionage and the political espionage um, because um, the technical espionage, you can see that it was directly used. Um, it was used in Korea, it was used in Vietnam, it was used um, elsewhere, and, and it had consequences. And of course, the atom bomb had, had, had consequences. So that um, put, put espionage in, a, in an entirely different light. And, and of course, the whole Rosenberg case uh, was about atomic espionage. It wasn't about the thousands and thousands of pages of documents that they got uh, about other, other topics. So, yeah, that's at the heart of it. A, a broader issue that I, I think is just worth putting on the table as another puzzle that, alas, is not really resolved by this, which is, you know, did A, did the precise date of the Soviet acquisition of the bomb change as a result of the espionage. David Holloway, in his 1994 book, estimates, estimates that the, it accelerated their timetable by six months to two years. I don't know if he still sticks by that. But it brings up another issue uh, of the period late 1949, early 1950, which is did uh, the Soviet acquisition of the bomb in August 49 uh, affect Stalin's decision to authorize the Korean War? And alas, I don't think, from uh, quickly looking through the book and talking to the co-authors, that we get any clarity as to whether espionage uh, in Washington buttressed what Stalin was hearing publicly from Dean Acheson at the National Press Club speech and other public statements that caused him to change his mind and authorize Kim Il-sung's invasion. And we do have evidence from Russian archives in, in the Cold War Project's uh, working paper, uh, I think it's number 38 by Catherine Weatherby, that when Kim does go to Moscow secretly in April 1950, Stalin does say, it, we have information from Washington that it is true that the Americans are more cautious, and this does indeed seem to embolden him to authorize the initiation of the Korean War. Um, one, however, can take a completely contrarian approach and say, the sooner the Soviets got the bomb, the sooner you had the advent of mutual nuclear deterrence. And in fact, that helped stabilize the Cold War, and the sooner they got it, uh, the sooner World War III became less plausible. And that, of course, I'm simply endorsing that great radical revisionist John Lewis Gaddis, who causes the advent of nuclear weapons, one of the great stabilizing forces in international affairs after World War II that helped uh, promote the uh, existence of a long peace rather than a Cold War. Sorry? Talk to John about that. Um, <laughs> no, but but well, my point is that it, it, it engages no. much broader issues that are, are absolutely critical and fascinating, but go beyond the technical well, details. Have, no, let's Thank look you. at the last. No, I have a question. Oh, oh okay. <laughs> well, last question, because we're almost yeah. ready my, for my last question. Now, 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 now. Wait for the microphone. <laughs> my last question is for Bart. Uh, Bart, you talked about the. Uh, utility of counterfactuals. This isn't exactly a counterfactual, but you raise the, the issue about um, uh, given the um, extent that we now know of Soviet espionage, should it lead us to uh, reevaluate uh, the loyalty program? So I'd like to, to ask you, um, in light of this new knowledge, um, how, would, how do you uh, evaluate now the loyalty program, and has this impelled you to look in a different way upon uh, your entire assessment of the so-called McCarthy era? 
<laughs> well, I was going to say, there's probably a lesson here, and I think the admonition commandment for Moses, I think it's a fourth commandment, is don't open the door to questions you can't answer fully. Uh, I think that's what's the answer, Mel, is that I've been thinking about this for a handful of years, and I haven't really put it together systematically. I oscillate. I am more empathetic, or at least I'm now empathetic to Truman in a way that, say, 20, 30, 40 years ago, I was not on the issue of the loyalty security program. I'm not sure that its details were effective and probably one could have constructed something that would have been more likely to get the right people and not get the wrong people. Uh, and I think that's one of the great liabilities. But when I thought about it 30, 40 years ago, uh, I really painted with a broad brush and assumed there wasn't much of a problem. Uh, the related issue that I would, was going to ask, but I uh, deleted it on the grounds of a trammeled and truncated presentation of only 15 and a half minutes, uh, was whether the Truman administration could have sold the program more skillfully by saying, look, uh, you know, there are real cases of espionage. We can't reveal them for various reasons of prosecution, investigation, et cetera. But through judicious leaks, uh, as things were being pursued, maybe indicated to some reporters, what the lines were, that might have produced a very different late 40s and in a strange way might have made it impossible for McCarthy <coughs> because the administration would have already undercut by saying more and arguing more forthrightly and emboldened at the same time. But having said all that, let me uh, offer you the admonition collectively that this is in, I'm in the process of rethinking and this is less in Kuwait but maybe better than inchoate. All right, with that, let us all rethink, and I'm going to turn it over now to Mark Kramer for his final conclusions. Okay, I'm, I'm going to give um, I'm going to give uh, people an opportunity to comment, but I'm, I want to structure it a little, and, and, and including uh, um, is is Don here? Because uh, okay, back here, um, uh, and I, I will give others as well, and and I have leeway to go over. So so um, bear bear in mind though we do have a, I, I have to catch a plane among other things at <laughs> eight o'clock. So. Um, but uh, uh, three hours. <laughs> the, um, let me let me um, just start out with a quick couple of comments, and then and then uh, I'm going to try to structure it a bit. Is um, in first, I want to thank Christian and Tim, who's just stepped out uh, for having organized this conference, which is definitely one of the most heavily attended conferences I've ever been to here, and I've been to a lot of them. Um, the, the, uh, I also want to thank Alexander, John, and Harvey for having made these materials available. Uh, that does, the availability of these materials does allow us th to assess them. This isn't the case of, um, w was it Richard Reeves you mentioned, Bart? Um, it, it's not a case of that uh, because we do have these materials. There are things you can check against them, not everything, but you can check certain items there. I mean, there are, there are KGB archives in the Baltic states that are completely open. Uh, you can find there a lot of central Soviet KGB documents. And in fact, when I was assessing the, um, the reliability of the Vasilyev notebooks, I did uh, go specifically to Lithuania and Estonia uh, where the, the KGB holdings are much more extensive because a lot of the ones in, in Latvia were destroyed and, and try to find things that would bear on these. And you can occasionally find items there that bear on what is in the notebooks, especially one thing that I was pleased to find was uh, were several things that cited materials from the KGB archives and I was able to compare the notations with what um, 
Alexander had for, for a specific holding. So, I mean, there are a lot of ways to go about checking it. No one is taking these notebooks at face value. You have to use all the sources, and that's what I think that this conference was designed to do, is to get that process underway. Um, the special issue of the journal contains six articles, and as I mentioned, there are two uh, further articles that will be appearing in, in later issues of the journal. Um, uh, I, I have already been asked by people about uh, the, uh, the ability to submit articles by this. We, we would welcome further manuscripts on this. I don't think I can run another spe whole special issue on it, but, um, but uh, correspondence, normally we don't publish letters to the editor. We put those up on the, our website. But uh, you're, I, I am considering, though, making an exception in this case that, uh, that we would actually publish them in the journal. It takes up space, and MIT Press is very strict about page limits. The, part of the reason that we had to limit it to the six articles in this issue is that it was way over the page limits. But, but still, um, you know, there are n many ways to take part in the further evaluation of these materials and to, uh, to, to get a very good sense of how they fit into the historiography of both Soviet espionage and uh, the historiography of the Cold War. And that's where I'd like to turn now in structuring the discussion and then opening it up, um, is to say, just uh, assume, because again, there are many sources that show that there was extensive Soviet espionage in the United States. Uh, the Venona Papers, um, many other sources, including the Vasilyev Notebooks. Um, just uh, assume that and, and look at some of the specific cases. What, what is the broader significance of that? That is, for such things, the type of issues that Jim Hirschberg um, raised at the end uh, about understanding wartime diplomacy, for example, Stalin's goals at uh, the wartime conferences, um, the origins of the Cold War, how this bore on the origins of the Cold War. Bear in mind, through Venona, U.S. officials knew a lot about Soviet espionage. They didn't know as much as, as, it, as it is in the Vasilyev notebooks, but they did know a lot, but were unable to use it um, very much because for fear of compromising it, even though it had already been compromised. But the, um, uh, so th there, there are numerous ways that we can try to think about the broader significance of these. Um, some of the issues raised in the Hurricane article about, uh, in, in the Uston article about um, Soviet science and technology development, how that espionage affected it. Uh, some of this has been discussed with regard to nuclear weapons, as Jim mentioned about uh, in David Holloway's excellent book. But um, what else can we think about there? With regard to uh, the issue that Mel Leffler raised, um, if others want to comment on that, I would welcome it, is uh, about how, if at all, it leads you to reassess uh, measures enacted under the Truman administration and then the rise of McCarthyism as well. So let me, uh, let me open it for comments, and please try to keep the comments relatively brief. Uh, it, you're welcome to comment on, on I, I would prefer it on these broader issues, but if you, want, if you really want to comment on a specific issue, please do, um, please do that as well. I'll turn first to, I had promised Don Guttenplan that I would uh, allow him uh, the opportunity to speak at this final session. So let me turn first to him. Well, first of all, thank you, Mark, for making the time available. I appreciate it. Uh, I realize now that part of my mistake this morning was not trying to address a panel that was chaired by Ron Radosh, who obviously takes a more liberal view of uh, using the gavel. Um, I also want to say that I'm very glad I sat through the last session, because uh, when I set out to write my book about I. F. Stone, I was very cognizant that it was the Cold War was over, and I was hoping to write a, a post-Cold War biography. And in a sense, what I was hoping for about Stone was the kind of discussion I've just listened to about Oppenheimer, where you disagree about the evidence, you disagree about the conclusions, uh, but you're not refighting the Cold War. You're talking about evidence, argument, 
handling of evidence, you're looking at the documents. And I have to say that, that I don't think that's what we've had in the discussion about I.F. Stone that we heard this morning, and that's, I don't think, what we have in spies. Uh, like Max Holland, I don't subscribe to the conspiracy theory of history. So although it wouldn't be difficult uh, to argue that um, Alexander Vasilyev is not the man to vouch for the credibility of your book's primary source material, that is not my argument. I, I'm sorry, Alexander, if you, if you thought that I was implying that you are, are faking or did fake material. I'm simply saying that we have to take your word for it because there's no way to check the, the materials because other historians don't have access to it. Similarly, while you could argue with at least as much plausibility as spies that I.F. Stone's scathing articles in the New York Review on abuses in Soviet psycho psychiatry and endorsing the, wor the works of revisionist historians of the Stalin era, such as Medvedev or supporting Sakharov, made him an enemy of precisely the Soviet state and its Russian authoritarian successor, uh, which the SVR who arranged this, ac uh, this uh, access uh, would be, was proud to serve. It's not my argument uh, that, this, that, that the stone material is part of any disinformation campaign. I simply suggest uh, that, as I said before this morning, if you take the material at face value, it still doesn't come close to proving the charge that I.F. Stone was a spy. Um, and uh, I think the problem is that where Stone is concerned, the authors, the authors over-egg every pudding and leave out exculpatory facts. And that was exactly the kind of discussion that I noticed was not the case with the Oppenheimer evidence, where it was tentative, where there were allowances for multiple points of view. Let me give you an example of over-egging. Uh, on page 151, there's the, the imperative voice used, pancake should tell Dodd. Now, I, for uh, my sins, am a card-carrying member of the North London Reform Synagogue. Uh, and I get mailings. I got a mailing during the Operation Cast Lead saying that I should go out and demonstrate my support uh, for Operation Cast Lead. It was in the imperative voice. That does not mean that I'm a member of the Zionist conspiracy, and in fact, I didn't go out and demonstrate it. In somebody saying that Pancake should do something doesn't mean that he did it and isn't evidence that he did it. Uh, for exculpatory evidence, uh, the, the authors quote Stone saying, or Abelard Stone saying, that the, 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 uh, the election of FDR closed the one road that might have made a difference to the working class is the road to a Soviet America. And they say that that, and they, they point out that Stone wrote this in 1933 under a pseudonym, and that it was very close to the Communist Party line, all of which is completely true. Uh, and by the way, if we were having a, a calm discussion, I would also uh, tell you something that you couldn't get from just reading the galleries of my book, which is that Stone was not, that Mark Stone was not the only member of his family who belonged to the Communist Party. In fact, all of Stone's siblings belonged to the Communist Party, except I.F. Stone. Um, but, but it's also true that that statement was made in the modern monthly, a Trotskyist magazine whose, whose editor, V.F. Calverton, had been attacked as a sex pest in new masses only a couple of months earlier. And I know for a fact that John Haynes knows this because I still remember sitting on the floor of his office gleefully going through ish original copies of Modern Monthly with him. And yet the fact that this statement which he uses comes from a Trotskyist magazine isn't mentioned. Similarly, in 1949, it, during the period that, that Max Holland calls the blank period, uh, there was the case of James Cutcher, the, leg the legless veteran, who was a member of the Socialist Workers' Party who was denied his pension as a security risk. Now, Kutcher, Kutcher's case was such an anathema to, this, to the Soviet Union and the Communist Party, and as we know, the Soviet Union was still obsessed with Trotskyism in 1949, uh, that Paul Robeson denounced him and denounced his defenders. But I.F. Stone was on the Kutcher Defense Committee in 1949, and this, this is an obscure fact, but it also happens to be the Kutcher Defense Committee happens to be the subject of an article in Dissent in 1968 whose author is Harvey Clare. And yet again, this context is not mentioned in Spies. Um, also, since Max Holland cites my book, and since he makes so much of the context behind Kalugin's meetings with Stone, he must know that the real purpose of the meeting, from Stone's point of view at least, was to cry to get the Soviets to release the imprisoned writers Yuli Daniel and Andrei Sinevsky. Of course Stone knew that Kalugin was KGB. Everybody I talked to who met with Kalugin, from Nick Daniloff to Marvin Kalb to Stu Lurie to Stephen Rosenfeld, all knew that he was KGB. The point is that viewing those interactions only from the KGB point of view completely distorts their meaning. As any working, working journalist knows or ought to know, influence operates both ways. If, 
Uh, Fine. I'm going to wrap it up in Let's three more seconds, I promise. Uh, if the authors had stuck to the facts that Stone was probably a witting source for the KGB at a time when there's no law against what he was doing and every reason to believe that communists were sincere in their opposition to fascism, we would have no argument. It gives me no pleasure at all to say this about men whose work I've long admired, but by going well beyond the facts and for their cavalier handling of evidence, they ought to ask themselves whether at last, long last, they too have no sense of decency. <laughs> okay, yes, let me let me uh, let, let, let me open. Okay, give first to Harvey, and then uh, it, it, by the way, if people want to speak, could you indicate it to me, and I'll try to keep um, the list. I'll just say one or two things uh, in response to that. Uh, first of all, uh, the the section on Stone is relatively brief. I think it's about five pages in a seven hundred page book. Um, uh, that's number one. Uh, number two, uh, Don, you'll, you'll note if you read the section more carefully than I fear you have, um, that we say that Stone was an agent from 1936 to 19, late 1938, probably 1939. We are agnostic about anything after 1939. We, we talk briefly about the Venona material but we say that there's nothing in the Vasiliev notebooks that uh, prove one way or the other whether and how he responded to Provden's approach. Uh, we talk about Kalugin's different uh, explanations. Uh, we make absolutely no judgment about whether Stone was working for or with the Soviet Union in the 1950s or the 1960s. Um, what we say is that there is, first of all, and, and I think uh, this is one example where you're, you're just way off, uh, in, your, in your book uh, you've added a little uh, at one point and at the bottom of the page suggest that the evidence is still unclear about whether pancake is stone. Um, well, there is a 1936 KGB document which says Pancake is Isidore Feinstein. Um, and, and I did not interrupt you, so I'd appreciate the same kind of courtesy. Uh, and second, uh, there is a sentence which indicates that in 1938, on the register of the agents of the New York Residentura is Pancake. Uh, I think it's entirely appropriate, and uh, I have no sense of shame for saying that from 1936 to 1938, Isidore Stone was an agent. L l uh, John, and l l let me say that there, there is going to be room for debate about this issue and other <laughs> issues in the journal. I, I hope we won't focus exclusively on I F Stone in this final session. Uh, John. I just wanted to add uh, that uh, uh, this is one of the reasons why we put the notebooks on the web so everyone can actually see the references. Uh, the notebooks uh, also report KGB documents that indicate uh, Stone passing on from an agent, an actual source that he helped to recruit, uh, William Dodd, uh, military information from the U.S. Embassy uh, in Berlin. Uh, Dodd uh, was a long-term spy, a long-term agent uh, for the KGB, <coughs> not a particularly successful one, but he was recruited through I.F. Stone. Uh, you know, the, the espionage uh, enterprise requires lots of things to work. It is not just the source and the officer. It also requires couriers. It, couldn't, it can't work without couriers. It can't work without talent spotters. It can't work without people who help to vet the background. It can't work without uh, agent handlers. All of them are participants in espionage. Um, uh, yes, no, uh, uh, Just to change the subject, um, you uh, there have been uh, several people have mentioned the loyalty program and uh, how we view the loyalty program in view of all these uh, various revelations. Um, and I think the irony is that the loyalty program was introduced at the in the late 40s at a time when the, these KGB networks uh, were disintegrating or had already disintegrated. So it was rather like you know, shutting the uh, barn door after the horse had bolted. Um, and you can still you know, 
uh, believe that there was a there had been a huge KGB conspiracy in the United States, but it wasn't actually it wasn't wrapped up by the loyalty program. In fact, the loyalty program may have had the effect of um, sending uh, people uh, chasing after f false spies rather than the real one. Um, I'm gonna. I'm actually gonna ask Mel Leffler to address that question shortly since he mm -hmm. raised it. Um, but let me go then. <laughs> yes, I again wanted to thank the the organizers for the conference and also uh, Vasiliev and 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 the authors of putting the materials online. I think what we should not forget that the material. Uh, makes clear that Soviet espionage also had, was very disorganized in many cases and was self-destructive. Uh, and I think what is missing, what we can see, for example, I just looked at the, the white notebook again, uh, where the officer who evaluates Ovakimyam, the deputy station chief, writes that Ovakimyam has basically betrayed himself as an NKVD person to American counterintelligence. And I quote, um, if American counterintelligence tolerates Gennady, who is over Kimyam, as an intelligence agency in its country, this suggests that such an intelligence agent is not dangerous. So they suppose American counterintelligence is much better than, than they expect. And of course, later he is arrested. But the basically, is the fact is that the center always was very suspicious of its own station chiefs and agents <coughs> and distrusted them. And what we have to understand is that what we, we need to look more into is the rivalry, the suspicion, the intrigue, the failure, the inability and incompetence of Soviet espionage. So we shouldn't overlook that when we, when we discover more and more spies, that how effective were they, how effective were they in transmitting information, how was this information processed <coughs> at the center. Um, so that I think it's, it's clear we only have, as you said, a window. We have a lot of information that is not out there, and I think we have to look at that in comparison to other experiences. It is clear from what we've heard so far and what the sources tell us is that Soviet intelligence was most successful in countries that were allied to the Soviet Union. Um, my work is, uh, is on European theater and for the Soviet operatives in Nazi-occupied Europe, it was a completely different story. So in hostile territory where they should have been much more active, they were rather ineffective because counterintelligence was more, uh, uh, was, was more successful in uh, avoiding penetration and com combating Soviet penetration. So I think when we talk about Soviet success, it sometimes is success despite the internal self-destructive mechanisms of Soviet intelligence. Um, and I wanted to point out that yes, we have to take into account that there were GRU assets that we don't know about. Um, I looked at the Red Orchestra in, in Germany found out that it was much more of a myth than anything else, uh, but that in the course of, of their contacts, um, they also, unfortunately, the, the Germans actually uncovered a lot of GRU agents uh, that had not been um, identified, and these assets were much more important to uh, Soviet military uh, than previously thought, and much of the others were mostly unprofessional amateurs. And to me, that has this, that has this echo of George Koval here in your point, that he was much more important than many, many of the lower, uh, low-ranking figures that we might have been talking about. But thank you very much. Um, what, what Michael Dobbs mentioned about um, that closing, closing the door after the horses are out, you know, I mean, the governments do that, at least the American government does that frequently, as is been seen recently, I think, with the response to the economic crisis. But the, um, um, but it does, there is a related issue, though, is how the revelations of this through Venona, uh, obviously the Vasiliev notebooks weren't uh, available to U.S. policymakers, but about how that affected the origins of the Cold War, that is, their perceptions of Stalin's goals, um, and the like. And I'm going to uh, turn first to Jim Hirschberg to comment on this and then to Mel Laffler. Yeah, just to make a broader comment that, that's worth noting at a gathering like this is uh, as we move forward, 
possibly in future activities, to do everything we can to avoid the disciplinary demarcation between broad Cold War history and spy buffs interested in intelligence history in terms of trade craft and all these fantastically interesting stories because all these considerations that were just outlined in terms of understanding Soviet history are crucial, but what's missing is, okay, so what impact does all this actually have? And one thing that was wonderful flipping through one of the notebooks is that you know, there are a number of memos to Stalin about you know, some of the product and some of the events, like the arrest of, of Fuchs. Um, but still, you know, I think we're at an extremely early stage, and this goes for the American side also, of evaluating you know, how does intelligence actually influence decision making. And you know, this is something, you know, as we move forward, where we really need those who are you know, superbly versed in the intelligence aspect, but not to look narrowly at that uh, without looking at the interconnections between the center and the Politburo and uh, the others who are actually making decisions. Because you know, you know, the, the big question is, did it matter, all the spy versus spy, in the outcome of the Cold War, the evolution there? And so far, you know, there are episodic moments where we can find it really is crucial. The Soviet rejection of the Marshall Plan, 1946 being one early example that came out of the Russian archives. But as we move forward, I think it's crucial that we always keep both sides of the equation in mind, the intelligence historians, but also the broad Cold War historians, and to collaborate as, as much as possible. Thanks. Yeah, and, and also, as I mentioned yesterday, there are, there are materials um, in in the notebooks that <coughs> certainly weren't used in, in spies because, or in the articles for the journal, because um, it wasn't the purview of them. But they bear directly on foreign policy issues of the sort that that Jim was raising and. Um, Christopher Andrew, uh, back at sometime in the early 1980s, published this book called The Missing Dimension, which was about intelligence. And as Jim mentioned, until very recently, it was the missing dimension in a lot of historiography of the Cold War, but, it, but it's begin at least uh, on the Soviet side. And, um, but as it's beginning to emerge, to try to bring it into the larger picture, I think will be important. Let me turn to Mel Leffler since he's written one of the best books on the origins of the Cold War, and um, also was the one who raised the question of the loyalty program. So let me ask you to comment on both, Mel. How, has this changed, on the second question about has this changed your view um, of it as well? Well, I, I think I very much would associate myself with the comments that Jim Hirschberg just made and this gentleman um, over here, I don't know your name, I'm sorry. Donald O'Sullivan. Don O'Sullivan. Um, and uh, that is, I read this uh, material about um, all the intelligence efforts um, with a great deal of interest, but I really always have trouble linking it to the larger significance. And I've heard Christopher Andrew you know, say this multiple times in the last 10 years about, oh, now we have this intelligence and it reshapes our entire understanding of the Cold War. And I've never, never seen any indication um, that it really does uh, for the very reasons that although there is a lot of evidence, we don't know, as, uh, uh, as Donald Sullivan was saying here, we really don't know how it shaped highest level Soviet decision making. We know, for example, on the eve of World War II, right? Stalin had all this information. Did it really shape um, his, uh, his policies toward, not, toward Nazi Germany on the, ver on the very threshold of knowing that the, the, the Nazis were about to attack? So what is the significance uh, of all this information? As for on the American side, um, I've yet, uh, although I, uh, it's been more than a decade since I wrote my book, A Preponderance of Power, and I've sort of stayed abreast of the new literature, um, it's not at all clear to me that anyone has shown that this new information affected real decision making, um, Truman Doctrine, Marshall Plan, German policy, um, that this information about World War II espionage had a significant impact on any of that, even on American nuclear programs uh, from 1945 uh, to, to 1949. Okay, 1948 and 49, yes, abs absolutely, it begins to reshape it. But in the early years, 1945, 46, 47, it's not at all clear that any of this has a significant um, impact. 
So um, I, I, I think that Jim's statement about um, linking intelligence to decision making is really absolutely critical here. But also in terms of the evolution of American political culture, I mean, it clearly is one of the implications, uh, um, not only implications, but explicit arguments in some of the works by Harvey Clark and John uh, Earl Haynes that because we know this happened, therefore we should think very differently about the McCarthy era. Um, on the other hand, I embrace the comments that Michael Dobbs just said a few minutes ago, that at the very moment that uh, the cells were disintegrating and that policymakers knew the cells uh, were disintegrating, we, re we begin to reach the height of the McCarthy era. If that's the case, why should we rethink the traditional criticism of the, of, of the McCarthy era if, in fact, there really, at this point in time, were no spies, or very few, and if, in fact, policymakers themselves knew that was the case. So why should we look more sympathetically uh, upon this and have a reevaluation? So that's the way I'm thinking right now. Good. Thank you uh, very much, Mel. Uh, Stan? Well, there's no way to get into <laughs> all of the complexities of this aspect of the issue, but a couple of thoughts I would add to the mix, and perhaps some folks will want to have conferences about these matters down the road. Uh, one is the sort of bootlegged assumption, although not explicit, but certainly implicit, that the only thing we need to worry about was spying. And so if somebody wasn't stealing documents or blueprints or military secrets, then no big deal. Uh, I think that there's a lot of evidence that spying, bad as it was, was hardly the only or perhaps not even the major problem. Uh, far more significant, uh, at least on some of the stuff I've looked at, and I've looked at quite a bit of it, uh, was the influence of agents of influence in our government on policy uh, toward certain foreign policy matters. Uh, and uh, there's a very good chapter in this new book uh, about OSS and some of the Soviet agents who were in OSS, Duncan Lee and uh, Stanley Graves and others. Uh, and what these folks were doing, although they might have been doing some spying, uh, but through OSS and otherwise, also an OWI, which is not addressed very much in the book, uh, was uh, generating disinformation but all kinds of subjects like Yugoslavia, China, you name it. Uh, and these, uh, these uh, uh, activities were often made the premise of our policies, uh, policies that in my view were very often mistaken. I can't possibly argue that point any further here, but I want to raise it. Secondly, there is an assumption, and what the back and forth I've heard, that the Truman Loyalty Program was excessively repressive or something. I think there's a pretty good argument that it was not. Uh, that, in fact, it was very porous, that it was a cosmetic program in many respects, uh, basically foisted off, uh, uh, promoted in order to fend off the Republican Congress, the 80th Congress, which was all over the issue, and, and that's pretty explicit in the Spengarn papers and elsewhere. Uh, and so I think that, that assumption needs to be challenged also. Uh, and again, I can't possibly argue the merits of that, but I raise those two points for further consideration. Let me, before turning to John and then uh, Edward, let me just go back quickly to Mel. Mel, wh what if any um, question, you don't have to answer this right now, but maybe a bit later, it would be, um, say, w when George Cannon in 1947, when the CIA was created, 47, 48, wanted an aggressive program of political warfare, you know, which was essentially what we'd call uh, covert warfare now. Um, I'm just wondering, it could well be that he, just events um, influence him on that, but I'm just wondering whether you think some of these intelligence issues uh, or espionage issues also did and others. Um, but let me go to John and then uh, Edward. I just want to speak uh, for a moment about the closing the barn door. Uh, one of the things which we try to say, we try to say in, in uh, the book is that certainly by 47, 48, uh, the KGB stations in the United States were badly broken. 
uh, was almost as bad as it had been in 1940, uh, 41. All of their major networks were indeed shut down. There were only a few good agents left. And uh, certainly the Loyal Security Program, which by the way I think was uh, not well targeted, uh, was a closing of the barn door. But there's something to remember about that. The KGB in the late 1940s was attempting to rebuild uh, its previous networks. Uh, the barn door that had been closed meant that particular door could no longer be opened. Uh, the, the, the exploitation in 43, 44, and 45 of the party-based networks, which had been so successful in that period, was no longer possible because of the loyalty security program and because of the FBI's targeting and infiltration of the American party. Had that not been done, possibly they could have recapitulated the whole successful exercise. As it was, they had to turn to an entirely different and rather more traditional uh, way of recruiting uh, uh, spies and, uh, and other sources. The other point is that uh, while the KGB networks were indeed broken uh, by the late 40s, it isn't clear to me that the FBI realized just how devastated uh, the KGB stations were. I don't think policymakers had any confidence uh, that we had, in fact, broken uh, those networks or that there were other networks around that we had no knowledge of. Uh, they, there was, because we had, in a sense, been late to catch up once, were there other networks around? We didn't know. Um, let me, Edward. Thank you. Um, am I on the air? Yes, I am. Um, I'd like to comment very briefly on, on two questions that Mark and before him Mel raised. You asked about George F. Kennan's advocacy of political warfare and what the relation was to intelligence. There was a very direct <coughs> connection. Um, during World War II, the presumption in Washington was the Soviets would be dominant in Eastern Europe and control the region. The hope was that they could be induced or would of their own choose. Can, can people at the back here okay? No. Uh, can't hear me. What seems to be the problem? Maybe. Uh, like, like so? Yeah. Okay. Um, as I was saying, during World War II, the presumption was the Soviets would be dominant in Eastern Europe after the war, but the hope was that it would take a milder form than we actually saw, something along the lines of Finlandization. One of the great changes in American perceptions of the Soviet position in Eastern Europe came beginning in the late summer of 1945, based on intelligence sources. By the end of 1945, the Soviet position w in Eastern Europe was seen in many places as actually quite weak. And the reason for this was um, contacts between American intelligence and various forms of resistance movements in Eastern Europe. By the end of 1946, and actually is, uh, well, certainly by the, by the middle of 1946, the Strategic Services Unit was um, in contact with Ukrainian resistance, the Estonian resistance, the Lithuanian, Lithuanian resistance, the Polish resistance, among others. Um, in fact, arms were given to the Estonians as early as August of 1946. There's a very big story here. David Alvarez and I will be going into it in a book that will be coming out, I hope, uh, perhaps later this year or early next year. Um, to turn the equation around and look at the Soviet side of things, which Mel touched upon. There's an interesting question uh, to be asked about that. Throughout World War II, Stalin had very broad access into American policy making. There is very little about Am American policy in its broadest outlines the Soviets could not have asked, could not have found out if they chose to. We don't know, of course, exactly what, or very much, in fact, about what was reported to them, but it was obviously a very great deal. With the, Elizabeth, with the defection of Elizabeth Bentley in 1945, this came to a halt quite suddenly. So from a sort of intelligence cornucopia, he, what they passed into the relative desert that we see developing in the, uh, in the notebooks. Um, and an interesting question for investigation um, is how this affected Stalin's feelings about things, his perceptions of American policy, the confidence that he had in his own judgment, the confidence of his advisors. Things that w had been known until quite recently became essentially a matter of speculation. 
Mm. And I, I am inclined to think that this is probably very important. And for the, the, uh, Priscilla and then Tom. And then. Well, a point I would like to make, which is so obvious that in a way it doesn't need making, is Priscilla, that please speak in, uh, uh, hold the microphone like this. Is that what we um, didn't know, but what we feared, poisoned in a way the American climate for many, many years, and meant that the political atmosphere in which important decisions were made about how to deal with the USSR and with the other problems that developed over the years, there was no leader to interpret the meaning of what had happened <coughs> uh, and to put it in some kind of perspective. And, it, and the climate of fear engendered by what wasn't known and what was known has influenced our decisions in foreign policy up to the present day. And I speak of the <coughs> overarming, which we're about to have to deal with in arms control talks. But I think it all came from an overestimation uh, of the, uh, what the Soviet Union could do to us. And uh, so that this uh, poisoned, the, the atmosphere was poisoned for more than 50 years. Thank you. Um, so let me, uh, hang on one second. I'll t uh, let me just, so I get here and then here, and then Michael, and then Bart. As a lawyer, I just want to. I just want oh, to say no, how much actually, I it was, it was the gentleman next to you. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you wanted me to give the microphone to him. <laughs> Good, thank you. I'm, I'm Michael Warner. I'm a historian with the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, and I think uh, Professors Hirschberg and Leffler have asked exactly the right question here. Uh, what difference does this all make on the decisions that were made at the time? Um, I think this is the thing that we have to pursue. I think that um, Ed Mark has given um, uh, a partial answer to the question in that the lack of intelligence from, from the United States is, is suddenly going to be changing Stalin's views in certain ways. Um, I would add to that that the lack of intelligence that we had in the United States on the Soviet Union, comparable to the excellent intelligence that we'd had on Nazi Germany just very, very recently before, up till 1945, uh, that the fall off of that, info, of that intelligence and the fall off in our leader's confidence may explain partly why, uh, may answer in part your question of where is the influence on intelligence on decision making between 1945 and 1950. Um, it's not really there. Our intelligence was awful against the Soviet Union between 1945 and 1950. Um, but part of that part of the badness of American intelligence stems from Soviet espionage. Um, Kim Philby and others had given up the ultra secret to the Russians uh, during the war. Uh, William Weisband and the Army Security Agency gave up Venona, gave up um, uh, the cryptologic successes that we were having against the Soviet Union at that time. Um, so there is a direct example, I would say, of intelligence making a difference, making a huge information deficit for the United States. But I would like to go beyond that and say that I think this is an excellent topic for a future Woodrow Wilson Center conference, the influence of intelligence on Cold War decision making. I think we can have a lot of fun with that one. This, this actually is uh, precisely this topic is one that we plan to have as a special issue of it. But, but uh, the issue is not full yet. so. So if people, <laughs> if people want to submit articles for it, we're still accepting them. Uh, the, uh, the gentleman next to you. <laughs> As a lawyer, I want to express appreciation for the opportunity to attend this uh, conference of uh, top flight professional historians and see the different perspectives that our respective professions may have on, on certain uh, of these uh, topics. And I found particularly interesting the discussions of Professor Craig and Professor Bernstein on what the standard of proof should be and to what extent the legal standard and the historical standard should or should not uh, be employed. I think had this been a conference of lawyers rather than historians, one might have found more concern with the problem of uh, shortcomings in the legal system. Lawyers would be very disturbed if they learned that the federal government may have executed a woman one of the few women it's ever executed on the basis of evidence which turned out 
50 years later when grand jury minutes were disclosed to have probably been perjured evidence by the green glasses. That would be a matter of great concern. If lawyers were persuaded that Alger Hiss, whether or not a spy, was wrongly convicted of perjury, they'd attach significance to the wrongful conviction. And I would think historians, too, would want to consider what the effect would have been if his were entitled as a matter of law not to be convicted of perjury, what would the effect of that acquittal have been? Richard Nixon, in all likelihood, would not have been, two years later, the Republican candidate for vice president and later president. And Nixon himself said in his book, Six Crises, had it not been for the Hiss case, I might never have been vice president of the United States and a candidate for president. So I think our professions can share these interesting perspectives, and I hope in a future conference you'll include lawyers along with the historians. Thank you so much. Let, let me, uh, Michael, Michael Dobbs. Yeah, I mean the question of you know how uh, this, how what did Stalin make of this wealth of intelligence that he was getting from the United States, and uh, sometimes you know lack of intelligence can be a problem, but too much intelligence can also be a problem, particularly if it's uh, human intelligence. Uh, I just uh, wrote a book about the Cuban Missile Crisis, and the U.S. had wonderful human intelligence, or they had a lot of human intelligence uh, on Cuba in the months leading up to the missile, uh, to, to, to the deployment of Soviet missiles. But all that intelligence wasn't actually much use to um, when it came to um, uh, deciding what was happening on Cuba, because there was too much of it, and it was uh, m much of it was contradictory. And if you look at how the Russians and the l Russian leadership used a lot of this human intelligence that was coming out in, in the 40s, it's a similar problem. I mean, even the atomic intelligence, Stalin didn't really take seriously until the first um, uh, test in, um, in the summer of uh, 1945. It was only after the first test that they began to take this really seriously. Um, the some of the interesting things in this uh, back and forth between the Moscow Center and the agents in the field, you can see the skepticism about you know, some of the things that are being reported, the skepticism of the leadership, and not knowing quite how to evaluate this. So certainly I think that's a very good topic for another discussion, you know, what use all this stuff was actually to the Soviet leadership. And perhaps it was less use than we may have thought. In, in, uh, in the editor's note for the special issue, I do actually, in fact, take up an issue that um, <coughs> Mel mentioned about the uh, intelligence going to Stalin um, on, the, on the eve of the German attack or in, in the months leading up to the German attack. And he had excellent intelligence, absolutely um, spot on intelligence about what happened. Um, but it, in the end, it didn't matter. He still didn't move. I mean, I know Donald O'Sullivan is still here, and uh, he and I have seen in the state security archive in the former East Germany just the volumes of in, uh, intelligence, both domestic and foreign, going to the East German leaders, too. And you do have to wonder about the ability to make use of it after a while. I know some of the domestic intelligence wasn't used. I've seen these reams of transcripts of conversations that people had in public lavatories um, that, that uh, no one ac actually looked at. Bart Bernstein. Yeah. I want to follow up the issue that Jim raised and Mel spoke to, and I want to draw upon a little bit of research that I've done, although it was not focused on this issue. I think it uh, leads or provides leverage on the issue. If you look at 10 major issues in the origin, early development of the Cold War, I think from what I've seen in the archives, unless some American archives, unless some material has been added recently, uh, there's no evidence that really any substantial intelligence made a difference. But I would also say it's incumbent upon you to do a, a Gedunkin experiment of a counterfactual. What kind of evidence, if available, would have been likely to make a difference? So let me take the 10 cases. World War II, none sharing of the A-bomb with the Soviets. Now FDR, Stimson, et cetera, knew there was some espionage, although they had no notion of the magnitude. Would a notion of the great magnitude, Fuchs, et cetera, have led to a difference, or indeed uh, more concern about not sharing? 
Atchison and Lilienthal Baruch plans. There's no evidence that those plans in any way were formulated on the basis of any intelligence. And it's hard to imagine what kind of intelligence would have made a difference. The decision 4546 not to provide a loan to the Soviet Union, same kind of concern. U.S. policy involving Iran in 4546, I don't think any intelligence made a difference in American policy, nor again is it any likely intelligence to have made a difference. Uh, Truman's decision in August 45, steadfastly, with Stalin interestingly exceeding, not to move to Hokkaido. What kind of intelligence would have made a difference whereby Truman would not have demanded this and without military authority and implementation have wrung from Stalin a decision not to take Hokkaido, which Stalin probably militarily could have grabbed? The division of Korea in 45, where the Soviets could have taken all of it but decided to draw the line at the 38th parallel. Same kind of problem. Truman Doctrine? I think it works out similarly. Marshall Plan? Intelligence about Europe, yes, but not about the U.S. The coup in Czechoslovakia, there perhaps more intelligence might have led to a more variegated understanding of the complicated issues and might have less, led to less alarm in the U.S. So that's a case where more intelligence might have made a difference, but there's no evidence that intelligence did make the difference. The U.S. A-bomb buildup between 45 and 49 before Joe won, the buildup is rather slow. I mean, by 48, uh, you don't have that many bombs. It would have been given the U.S. economy the capacity to have many more. What kind of intelligence would have generated, demanded more? Uh, I think I'm prepared to offer as a very tentative conclusion, which I may end up with more than pancake on my face, the following proposition, that it's not at all clear that any of the American major decisions involved in origins and early Cold War were influenced substantially uh, by intelligence, and at most intelligence might simply have confirmed a sense of Soviet bad behavior and malicious intention, but it's not clear the details uh, made the difference. And therefore, we may have the strange relationship of intelligence, KGB, et cetera, stuff being wonderfully fascinating and allowing us to argue on Hiss, Oppenheimer, Stone, et cetera, and political culture in America. But that may not be systematically related to decision making at a higher level. And while the decision making operates in a political culture, we also know that decision makers can shape for various benefits, that culture. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move quickly now because I, I don't really want to go past five, and I have quite a few people uh, on the list. First, Steve Austin. I'll just make a quick remark then, which is that I think that you have to make a distinction between the kind of broad policy decisions that you're talking about and tactical um, issues on the ground. And uh, a lot of the technical intelligence um, provided the, uh, the kind of the platform that helped the Russians in developing radar, in developing uh, uh, military aircraft industry in, um, in, in numerous ways. Um, you know, and some of those intersected with big policy decisions. You know, you, you could argue that the technology that led to the shoot down of the U-2, um, you know, had its origins in, in um, Second World War espionage with the Rosenberg Ring, for example. Um, let me, I, I'm going to, again, have to move quickly. Let me first take the people who haven't uh, spoken yet. So this lady at the back, and then you. I, I guess I'm the lady at the back. Uh. <laughs> I, I don't know. All I saw back there was the lady. I thought it was, I thought it was the person. In front. I, 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 ju I just got a haircut, too, so that I wouldn't. Uh, uh, W wouldn't wouldn't uh, that confusion? I, I I didn't want to leave here without raising an objection uh, to a characterization uh, by Mr. Mark at one of our researchers, Svetlana Shervin, and I of such a wonderful job as one of the most prolific propagandists in the twilights of the Cold War, in uh, at a time when we're trying to encourage open discussion and. Uh, in, in a place like this, I, d I don't think these kinds of ad hominem 
attacks have really have any place. And the fact is that um, uh, Ms. Shervenier and Kai Bird wrote a piece in which they indicated that Wilderfoot may have been the spy Alice, but they were very careful, very, very careful to suggest that he might not have been a traitor and that whatever his motives had were, were of interest and may have been entirely patriotic. Now, my point is, is, is that uh, the, these, these kinds of statements to dismiss someone's research with that kind of phrase I just think has, has no place here. Thanks, so. um, okay. Have you read her books in Russian? Let me, yeah, let me, again, there's going to be ample opportunity in the journal to say, he, he did have his hand up though before, so let me, on that point only though. To add uh, briefly to uh, comments that Barton and uh, Mel made earlier, there actually is, in my judgment, a good deal of uh, evidence that intelligence affected um, d policy decisions in the early Cold War. Just Barton, hear you again. Okay. Uh, there is, in my judgment, a good deal of evidence that in intelligence information affected policy decisions in the early Cold War. Uh, Barton mentioned, for example, the loan, the loan issue. In 1940, late 1945, the OSS figured out quite accurately what Soviet gold, produ gold production was. And that was a, f was a factor um, in the calculations as to whether or not the, so the, the Soviet should be given a loan. It's too complicated to go into here, but the evidence is quite clear. In Germany, uh, the, the United States had essentially a complete understanding of what was happening in Eastern Germany, uh, very largely because of all the socialists who were forcibly incorporated into the Socialist Unity Party and who basically worked um, as a ready-made intelligence so agency for the United States. And similarly, as I indicated earlier, the relatively optimistic spirit of those like George Kennan, who advocated covert operations in Eastern Europe, owed a great deal to intelligence information uh, from Eastern Europe. The irony was that by the time that the country was prepared to act on that information, the window of opportunity had closed. So, and, and one could go on about that at considerable length, but believe me, intelligence is a very important part of the mix. Okay, let me go to this gentleman right here. And um, we're, we're drawing to a close, though, so. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It was an excellent conference. My name is Donald Hunter. I'm a retired uh, public school teacher, and I lived during the Second World War and the post-World uh, War II Cold War. And my question is, uh, another individual who was very prominent during that time was Whittaker Chambers. I didn't hear his name mentioned today. He may have been yesterday, but I wasn't here. So could one of the historians speak about his involvement in this Cold War? Um, well, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give Alexander Vasiliev an opportunity to speak briefly if you want to, um, Alexander. Okay, <laughs> and then, and then, uh, um, the, the, the answer to your question though is yes, Whitaker Chambers not only was discussed here, but um, is mentioned in the notebooks, uh, and, and especially in, um, you know, comes up in several of the articles that are forthcoming in the journal, and is also discussed <coughs> in um, the book Spies. So if you want to know more about him, there'll be ample opportunity. But um, I'm, I'm going to, uh, uh, if it's quick, Herb, if it's quick. I suggest that there are a couple more subjects for discussion and that it might be useful to have some more conferences. For example, it might be good to have a discussion of counter-revolutionary Trotskyism, which is a wonderful slogan of the 1930s and 40s. And then the slogan of McCarthyism, which was the same slogan, but re revamped a little bit for use in the 1950s and 60s. So it would be a useful thing to do. One of the things we might look at in the case of McCarthyism is to look at John Harvey's book. Uh, there's a letter that uh, John McCarthy sent to Senator Tidings in 1950 with a list of names of people uh, who should be investigated. Six of them are in the facility of notebooks and in John and Harvey's book. Now McCarthy didn't get those names out of the sky. He got them from the State Department security people. He knew exactly who he was talking about. It might be useful to discuss the slogan of McCarthyism okay. in the context of that. One more point. On the question of the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis, yes, there was a lot of human 
that there were missiles going into Cuba. And the mindset in the Directorate of Intelligence of, of the CIA was that the Soviet Union would never do anything like that. You only have to read the Special National Intelligence Testament. Soviet Union wouldn't do that. We have to not pay attention to those people. And furthermore, if you want to do some U-2 flights over that area, don't do that because the planes can get shot down. And this was the view of the Kennedy administration. I'm administration and of the National Security Advisor. Okay, okay, I'm, I'm, because I, I absolutely need to finish by five, and it's rapidly coming up to that. Let me, um, once again, just to, very quickly in conclusion, again thank Christian Osterman and and uh, and Tim for having done so much to bring about this conference. Um, Harvey Clare, John Haynes, uh, Alexander Vasilyev for having made available these materials and having started this debate. Um, and for everyone who's here for having come and having taken part, there will be ample opportunity to continue debating all of these issues, both the broader issues, which I hope people will deal with, but also some of the specific issues, including in the Journal of Cold War Studies. So let me thank everyone here. Thank you.